so he will be joining shortly okay so we'll have to monitor so we, we, now we, we have we, now we have three speakers and we'll start with those speakers first so first uh, sunil will go and then we can go to uh, dr danishree and then uh, dr uh, we are live sir okay so uh good evening to the uh, to the ophthalmology universe and uh, uh, on behalf of the ars uh, it's a pleasure to bring to you this uh, webinar on a very important topic uh, that is a uh, the triage uh, the triage organization of thoughts and the management of vitreous hemorrhage we have a very uh, i'll just like to put up this uh, share the screen and have the slide show sorry so we'll just start with the i hope it's visible uh, this is the topic we are looking at a walk-in patient with vitreous hemorrhage and we have eminent chairpersons who will be uh, leading uh, the show for us Dr. Harban Shalal, Dr. Lelit Verma, which who will probably be joining us, Dr. Shobit Chavala, the medical director of Prakash Netra Kendra at Lucknow, and Dr. Uh, R. Kim, uh, the, C the chief uh, medical officer and uh, of the Arvindai hospitals in uh, Madurai. We have uh, eminent moderators, uh, Dr. Santosh Panavar and uh, Dr. Manoj C. Mathur as uh, the top people in the AIOS, and uh, Dr. Oh. Dr. Kanti, which Vishwas will be doing, uh, sharing the honors of moderating the session along with me. Uh, the expert panel consists of some uh, very heavy hitters, Dr. Rajiv Raman from Shankar Netralia, Dr. Parveen Sen from the Agarwal Eye Hospital in Chandigarh, Dr. Ramindeep Singh from the Advanced Eye Center PGI Chandigarh, and uh, Dr. Pramod Bindi, uh, teacher for all of us, uh, the Director of Vitorial Services from Shankar Netralia. We have uh, some eminent speakers. Dr. Sunil will be uh, talking to us about the vitreous hemorrhage and how to triage it in a patient after anterior second surgery. Dr. Subindu uh, Kumar Boral will be talking to us from the Dishai hospitals, will be talk talking to us about the vitreous hemorrhage in an AMD patient. Dr. Rajiv Jain will be talking to us about vitreous hemorrhage in a patient with uh, DM uh, or known uh, diabetic retinopathy. Dr. Naresh Babu, uh, an important topic of vitreous hemorrhage in a patient uh, who has had a history of trauma. Dr. Danishri from Shankar Netralia will be talking to us about uh, persistent vitreous hemorrhage after uh, posterior segment surgery. And Dr. Mudit, uh, who will be talking about, uh, about uh, vitreous hemorrhage in a patient with known systemic uh, inflammatory in, infiltrative pathology and present to us an algorithm of management. So I would like to uh, hand it over to our chairpersons, Dr. Uh, Shobit and Dr. Kim for a few words before we start the first talk by uh, Dr. Sunil. Dr. Kim, please. Oh, thank you, Rani. I think it's uh, very uh, good to see this vitreous hemorrhage as a particular topic for the whole webinar because it's something that we tend to discuss usually as a part of DR or trauma. But I think this is a very good idea to have management of when a patient presence with vitreous hemorrhage. I think I won't take much time. I will let the speakers listen. And I, I really appreciate the organizers for choosing this topic uh, on vitreous hemorrhage. Thank you, Shobhan. And Dr. Shobit, please. It's an everyday situation which one sees in our OPT and uh, many times the clue. I have a very deep love for this topic because as a Dr. Gupta from Chennai was our examiner, this is just to kick off the mood of this symposium, I was a postgraduate student appearing in my final MS exam. Dr. Gupta gave me a case uh, he was our external examiner as to a case of unilateral vitreous hemorrhage. He asked me, tell me one most important investigation in this patient. I said the examination of the other eye and that one answer got me the gold medal in my MS. I think that kicks off the mood of this symposium in a correct uh, direction. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to uh, request Dr. Rupak to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Sunil, and then a quick, just a quick word, and then Dr. Sunil can take over from there. 
Dr. Sunil, in short, actually, is very good friend of uh, me and uh, Dr. Unni. So uh, this is this is um, on uh, other other note. But again, as a, as a veteran surgeon and an academician, as an organizer, is an uh, extraordinary person. And uh, uh, with with this short introduction, uh, uh, I would like to you know, request Dr. Uh, Sunil to start his first talk. Thank you, Rupa. Thanks for the introduction. Hope my slides are visible and I'm audible. Uh, the slides yeah, are audible. Yeah, yeah slide, mode. Slide, slide mode. Yeah, I'm audible. Am yeah. I audible? Yeah. Your voice is very clear, but your, your presentation, your slides are not coming. Only we now? can see your desk. Can you no. just stop the share? Can you stop the share and redo it, please? Yeah, sure, sure. It's so only you open the slides first and then you yeah. share. Yeah, open the slide presentation first. Now it's better? Much infinitely better. You can start, please. Thank you. Yeah. So whenever a patient walks in with a vitreous hemorrhage after anterior segment surgery, how to approach and how to manage these patients? Let me discuss. Uh, so can, you, can, can you put the slideshow view on, yeah. please? Yeah. Thank you. OK. So basically, when you see a vitreous hemorrhage after anterior segment surgery, the, it could be an early or a delay. Uh, as in many other causes, the causes for vitreous hemorrhage either could be vascular or mechanical. The vascular etiology will be discussed by my co-speakers, so I will not be discussing much regarding diabetic retinopathy, vein occlusion, and other things. Mechanical, some of the causes during which encounter during anterior segment surgery, I will be discussing in my further slides. The most common anterior segment surgeries we tend to perform are only a cataract extraction with or without IOL implantation. Other is a secondary IOL implantation. Uh, the wide range of glaucoma surgeries we tend to do now, the either could be in the form of trabeculectomy, valve surgery, or nowadays with the minimally invasive glaucoma surgeries, strabismus surgery, and the corneal procedures. As we all know, PVD uh, usually progresses very fast after cataract surgery. As shown by this pictorial diagram, uh, there is a sevenfold higher incidence of PVD within one year post-cataract surgery. So it is one of the significant and the most important cause for vitreous hemorrhage post-cataract surgery. So you tend to see the PVD-induced vitreous hemorrhage after cataract surgery or sometimes later during after cataract surgery, so when you do an ag laser capsulotomy. Intraoperatively, the incidence of PVD increases if one encounters a PC rent and associated with anterior vitrectomy. Basically, what happens in PVD is there will be vitreous traction on the retina and its vasculature. The patient may complain of flashes, floaters, sometimes cobweb-like effect. There could be an associated retinal tear on RD along with the vitreous hemorrhage. So one need to do a B-scan if the visibility is poor. And if the visibility is good, you can resort to an optical coherence tomography also. The B-scan, if it is associated with a vitreous hemorrhage, like uh, pictures, pictorial things clearly shows it could have a complete PVD. Vitreous hemorrhage could be associated with detachments. Sometimes the large tears can be picked up on a B-scan. Or even the retinal tractions can be picked up on a B-scan. So B-scan is a very useful tool if a patient has got a PVD-induced vitreous hemorrhage which helps you to make a decision faster and how to manage these cases. So one key thing is here is the patient should be followed up carefully. The other eye needs to be examined. Perhaps weekly you need to repeat an ultrasound to see the retinal status. Is there any retinal detachment or anything? The commonest mechanism we I explained before is could be an avulsed retinal vessel. There just could be an avulsion without any associated tear or an RD. The, sometimes the treatment aspect involves if you can clearly see the avuls vessel, you can directly do a laser photocoagulation to this avuls retinal vessel. If it is a major bleed, probably you may have to resort to also to a vitrectomy. Retinal tears are commonly seen in almost 70% of the patients with acute PVD associated vitreous hemorrhage. 
If you can see retinal tears clearly, you can do either laser barrage or a cryotherapy. So the management basically depends how early the patient presents, what are the B-scan findings, and the serial follow-up of the patient will help you to manage the PVD associated with the hemorrhage. So the prognosis should be play, uh, explained to the patient accordingly. The next commonest cause for the vitreous hemorrhage post any anterior segment surgery could be an iatrogenic glow perforations, which can occur either secondary to peribulbar anesthesia or a retrobulbar anesthesia. Sometimes in periocular injections can cause uh, uh, glow perforations. Even the bridal suture which you take during cataract surgery can induce a glow perforation. Strabismus surgery while taking the either the recession procedures when you are taking an equatorial level sutures for the fixation of the muscles, then it can perforate and can cause a bleed. Sometimes you may plan a Botox injections for strabismus surgery. The injections near needles can cause a glow perforation and cause a vitreous hemorrhage. The one thing you should remember is along with this vitreous hemorrhage in these glow perforation patients can have an associated retinal tear, subretinal hemorrhage, the vascular occlusion, the drug toxicity, whatever the lignocaine or whatever you use, if you use intraocularly and can cause a vascular occlusion and the drug toxicity to the retina. So the, sometimes what happens is glow rupture, uh, perforation may remain undetected. So one need to be very careful and take a thorough history, whether this could be the cause for the vitreous hemorrhage. It uh, tends to more commonly occur in the inferior temporal quadrant. Another thing is one should look at is these high risk cases, which are more prone to have a perforation associated vitreous hemorrhage than the other patients. Like somebody has got a very high myopia with an axial length, uncooperative patients, deep set eyes, previous extraocular surgeries, Suppose you tend to give a peribulbar anesthesia or a retrobulbar anesthesia in a sitting position and sometimes an anesthesia given by a non-trained person, it could be in the form of an early residency fellows or a residents or a non-ophthalmologist, you tend to have a glow perforation. So when to suspect a vitreous hemorrhage in an iatrogenic glow perforation, if the cataract is minimal, you tend to see a retrolental floaters in the form of early vitreous hemorrhage. Sometimes if it is a major perforation, you can have an hypotony. Dull reflex during a cataract surgery, which gives a clue that something is wrong in the posterior segment. And if you can feel the vitreous hemorrhage is of unknown etiology, other eye being normal, you should suspect a glow perforation. If the perforation is clearly seen, you can either do an LIO in this case, the, the, using a laser indirect ophthalmoscope, you can seal the, the site of perforation. The prognosis is good if there is no associated subretinal hemorrhage or a minimal vitreous hemorrhage. So better to proceed with the surgery if you have suspected low of the rupture and a dense cataract. Like in this case, the patient had a dense cataract. And these patients need to be tackled and treated early because there could be an associated vitreous hemorrhage and RD can cause a PVR and a prognosis may worsen. So continue with your FACO. But one should be very careful doing a FACO emulsification in an hypotonus glow. But uh, tackling the cataract will help you to handle the posterior segment uh, uh, better with a better visibility. Once you've done that, you can introduce your trocars and go with a regular, uh, uh, like your MIVS 23 gauge pass plan of vitrectomy. Clear off the vitreous hemorrhage, which will allow you to see the underlying retina or associated tears or a subretinal hemorrhage or the site of perforation will be clearly seen. Like in this case, there was a tiny perforation with a surrounding subretinal hemorrhage. So the prognosis is good because the, there is not much uh, uh, chance, there was no retinal detachment or the macular area was healthy. So the prognosis should be clearly explained once you've done a proper vitrectomy with PVD induction, then identify the site area and you can do the endolaser to the site area of perforation and you can do a fluid air exchange or uh, you can uh, just put leave you and an air and can come out. So the prognosis basically depends upon whether there's a plain perforation or an associated vitreous hemorrhage how big is the tear? How much is the macular involvement? Suppose something is a subretinal hemorrhage in the macular area, one may have to resort to injection of the TPA and other things and all. So the decision depends upon case-to-case -case basis and the eye oil can be implanted safely and the cases can be completed like this. This is a case of a globe perforation. So another entity which is explained for the post-cataract surgery vitreous hemorrhage could be wound related, which you typically tend to see in the era of ECC and ICC where the wound gaping used to be more unlike uh, the recent uh, clear corneal phaco emulsification. So tunnel associated bleeds, which causes the recurrent bleeding. The Basically, the, this, there is a syndrome described by name known as a Swan syndrome, where you tend to see a wound neovascularization from the episcleral vessels. These vessels tend to bleed repeatedly and cause a vitreous hemorrhage. So one should be uh, keep in mind the wound opposition and the wound neovascularization should be tackled to prevent this vitreous hemorrhage associated with this Swan syndrome.
the other commonest cause for vitreous hemorrhage post cataract surgery is the iphema iphema the anterior segment bleed can uh, pass on to the posterior segment and can cause a vitreous hemorrhage especially if there is a pseudophakia a fakia if there is a zonular integrity has been altered during surgery or during a uh, if you clear a zonular dialysis intraoperatively or if there is associated subluxated cataracts or congenital defects in the iris or zonules will allow the iphema to enter into the posterior segment and can cause a vitreous hemorrhage Increased risk of uh, vitreous hemorrhage is definitely seen if there is an associated high myopia, uncontrolled hypertension, uncontrolled IOP, and if the patient is on anticoagulant or other medications, the risk of vitreous hemorrhage increases. The another commonest cause for the vitreous hemorrhage post cataract surgery is the iris related bleed. Whenever if you are planning to do an iridectomy, if it is a vascularized iris, or you create an iatrogenic iridodialysis, or bleed from the NVI, as I told before. Angle and iris bleeds are the commonest, which causes the IV and which can cause vitreous hemorrhage. So, iatrogenic iris damage sometimes can be due to poor surgical techniques also. Suppose if you are doing a phaco emulsification in a small pupil or a floppy iris, you can catch or eat up the vascularized iris and can cause a bleed. Or forceful eye oil injection technique, or because of the poor cartridges, which can cause the damage, the iris and angles can bleed and which can go into the vitreous cavity. Even the cutter associated bleeds can occur if there is a, if you eat up the iris or you cause a damage to the iris during vitrectomy, during anterovitrectomy, it can cause a vitreous hemorrhage. Secondary evils, what are the causes for vitreous hemorrhage? ACA evil, definitely angle bleeds can occur. Iris sutured evils by the iris damage. During iris claw evils, when you're doing enclaving this uh, iris claw evils, you can damage the iris or please an iridodialysis, which can cause the bleed. If there is a, if you are placing an uh, iroda capsule or addition is there, you tend to do a synecolysis. If there is a two strong additions, which can cause an iris bleed from the iris or a ciliary body can cause that. If you are planning a steel fixated eye oils, needle track from the ciliary body can cause the vitreous hemorrhage. And if you are planning an anterior vitrectomy through pars plana, sometimes the sclerotomy related bleeds can occur. But one should be very careful in any of these manifers not to induce an hypotony during surgery. Because hypotony itself may, can precipitate a supracoroidal hemorrhage and which can cause a breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage. Pediatric cataract surgery, definitely, if you are doing an anterior vitrectomy, similar thing can occur. Another one entity I would like to highlight here is the PHPV or a persistent hyaloid primary vitreous from the hyaloid vasculature. Sometimes it can bleed and can cause that. And during lensectomy, if you are not very careful, if you are using an, a vigorous suction and other things, it can cause zone your traction on the peripheral retina and the ciliary body region and can cause a bleed. So one should be very careful in this pediatric cataract surgery patients. Sometimes the breakthrough hemorrhage can occur from the supracoroidal hemorrhage. So it is commonly tend to see in high myopia, aphakia, anticoagulant medications. So one need to drain the supracoroidal hemorrhage before you uh, tackle the, the vitreous hemorrhage. So it is a very simple method of placing an AC maintainer or a, uh, creating and uh, introducing a cannula in the anterior chamber. You can drain the supracoroidal hemorrhage and go into the pass plana vitrectomy. Trabeculectomy, of course, it can bleed from the scleral wound where you create a trabeculectomy flaps. So scleral suture, if you take a very deep suture, it can bleed. Similarly, iridectomy and angle bleeds, even the supracoroidal hemorrhage also can bleed in a trabeculectomy patient. In the keratoprosthesis and keratoplasty, same thing if your iris and angle neovascularization, synecolysis, vascularized iris grafts also can sometimes bleed into the, if there is an aphakia, can bleed into the vitreous cavity. Another syndrome which has been typically described that is known as the UVIT is glaucoma iphema syndrome where it occurs typically due to the shafting from the eye oil implants when you place it in the sulcus, they tend to cause the, the, uh, the secondary iris neovascularization, pigment dispersion, recurrent iphema and vitreous hemorrhage. The fugues, another entity which is may be associated with cataract and uh, angle neovascularization and iris neovascularization, these also tends to have a bleed and cause a vitreous hemorrhage. So in an anterior segment surgery, use a proper surgical techniques to reduce iatrogenic complications like iris damage and ciliary body damage. Identify the iris cases, uh, cases, identify the cause which will help you to decide whether to observe or an interview. Rule out the systemic uh, disorders associated with this. As uh, uh, the Chawla, Shobhi Chawla has rightly said, carefully examine the other image, gives the clue to the diagnosis. Globe perforation vitreous hemorrhage needs to be intervened early based on whether associated tear, detachment is there or not. Vitreous hemorrhage with supracortal hemorrhage can be prevented by identifying the iris ca cases and can be treated. But one thing I would like to highlight here, but uh, with the use of anti vegf definitely the bleed risk is reduced because it reduces the iris nevascularization and angle nevascularization risk. So you need to plan accordingly, case to case basis, which will help you to tackle the patient accordingly. Thank you, thank you, Anil. Thank you for the patient here.
thank you sunil uh, thank you so much sunil for that uh, it was a very uh, exhaustive and uh, informative at the same time so but i just want a big, for the uh, for the benefit of our listeners with a general perspective if you had to put forth an algorithm uh, for looking after cataract surgery not after everything just after cataract surgery uh, vitreous hemorrhage how would you ask a, gen, a general ophthalmologist or a, a bit, uh, even a retinal surgeon to proceed? Yeah, the first and foremost uh, only is that take a relevant history regarding Can the... Can you stop the uh, sharing, please? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, the first and foremost would be to taking a relevant history, uh, whether it's the patient is on any medication or any associated systemic disorders and other things and all. The second thing is, is there any history of uh, the, the, the anesthesia, peribulbar anesthesia or anything of that sort? The next thing comes is that the first and foremost is any patient with a cataract surgery, if you see a vitreous hemorrhage, dilate the patient, examine both the eyes, which will cue the, in the high with the vitreous hemorrhage. If the visibility is good, look for the cause. If you can identify the cause for the vitreous hemorrhage, it could be a tear, it could be a vulst vessel, it could be some other causes, which will be the vascular causes, which the other speakers will be highlighting. So dilate and see the patient first. If you can't see the cause for the vitreous hemorrhage in a dilated uh, this thing also, then go ahead with a do a B scan. So B scan will sometimes will give a clue to that. And if it is suspecting in high risk cases like breakthrough from a supracondylar hemorrhage or a perforation, which needs to be taken up and treated as early as possible, if the visibility is good and you can identify the cause, treat the cause accordingly. Thank you. Could we have some comments from our panel, please? Yeah, uh, Dr. Sunil, it was a, a great talk. The few few points I would like to add here, I think you already said the ultrasound is the key here, actually. So uh, I think uh, if you have, if if you are seeing some, you know, uh, peripheral degeneration areas in the in the other eye, and uh, you always should suspect that uh, uh, the other eye had bled because of the, you know, uh, probably a PVD and uh, 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 that degeneration has given away or the, 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 there's a break. So I always uh, tell my residents to look for the uh, these breaks. And if you have a full blown, you know, vitreous hemorrhage, these breaks are normally, you know, superiorly they are there. So they have to look for it superiorly. Uh, inferior walls vessel or inferior uh, uh, break will cause inferior bleed. So superior is very important. Plus, uh, it's very important to look for the perforation sites, not always inferior temporally. People tend to block some, uh, little bit, give blocks superior nasally also. That's a common area I've seen. So you should always... Uh, uh, while doing ultrasound, you should look for the vitreous incarceration into those, uh, you know, the areas of perforation. Uh, they, 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 they are good clues. So uh, always do your ultrasound yourself if, if you are going to operate that patient. This is what I believe in. Thank you. Yeah, just uh, only I would like to add one more entity here, particularly when dealing with a total cataract. What Dr. Ramandeep also said, look for other eye because sometimes there can be pre-existing vitreous hemorrhage. You won't know because probably cataract things are very hazy. And once you remove the cataract, and uh, then you realize probably there's underlying vitreous hemorrhage. Now that's why what I would suggest: once if you are doing cataract surgery and you are not seen fundus before, you are not aware of what it is. In, so it makes it makes sense to examine the fundus on the table right then and there. So at least you know later on when you are dealing with vitreous hemorrhage whether it was pre-existing or it happened due to your surgery or later on probably maybe. You will be able to differentiate whether he's dealing with a uh, like with a fresh or old vitreous hemorrhage. But patient goes with a cataract surgery, we do not dilate pupil, call him straight after two, three days or maybe sometime even straight after two weeks because their tendency now to send the patient off on the same day, uh, very likely that we can miss those old vitreous hemorrhage as well. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to add one thing. I think very good talk and so I was just thinking of algorithm which you were telling. So probably you can think of a acute setting or a chronic setting later on, late onset and the very early post-op. Early post-op, you want to see whether it was an eventful surgery or an uneventful surgery. If it was an eventful surgery, as many of the causes he has mentioned, you try to find out and see that is it only a, a because of the entire thing or you have some retinal pathology break is seen, you want to laser it. You tend to be a little more aggressive in an early heme. You don't want to wait for a long time. If PVD induced with him, as you rightly said, 60-70%, it is a tear. So you, if suppose the visualization is not there and you are suspecting, you tend to go early. In contrast, if it's a late hemorrhage, usually late hemorrhage means one of the 
investigative tool you will try to use is a UBM because it's something it is touching the iris where the bleed is occurring, if nothing else. And definitely other eye evaluation is important. Many times, even if you are thinking of a vascular pathology, not a bad idea if it's a thin heme, not dense heme, do a FFA, you may find some uh, new vessels there. So I think late heme, you tend to investigate a bit more rather than immediately going. Early heme, your threshold for surgery is less. You tend to go early and clean it. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajiv. I, um, I think we have to get on to the next talk. Uh, Dr. Uh, next talk, Dr. Rupak will uh, introduce our speaker, please. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Sunil, thank you. And all the panelists have put it right way, uh, how to proceed about it. And now, if you have a vitreous hemorrhage, you have resolved it. But again, if it comes recurrently, that is the situation. That is a situation when it is, you know, very difficult to handle. And uh, I would like to request Dr. Dhanasri Rata, Senior Consultant, uh, uh, Veteran Services, Shankar Nathalai Chennai, to address on this topic. And uh, she and uh, all, all, all of us here knows uh, and uh, Dhanasri Rata as an excellent clinician, fantastic teacher, and a great academician. Uh, Dr. Dhanasri, please. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you, Rupak, for the kind invitation and also for the wonderful introduction. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, you know, uh, participate in these AIOS activities. So I would like to share my screen now. And uh, I think it is visible. Yes, yes. Yeah. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about persistent vitreous hemorrhage after vitrectomy. So, vitrectomy is the most commonly performed posterior segment surgery and the most common indication is a diabetic retinopathy complication. Now, among the diabetic retinopathy indications also, a non-resolving vitreous hemorrhage is the most common indication uh, for uh, performing a posterior uh, vitrectomy. And often there are large fibrovascular proliferation uh, associated with either tractional or retinal detachment in these say, uh, uh, patients. Now, in the last uh, past two decades, there have been enormous advances in the instrumentation, such as the MIBS and the wide-angle viewing system, which has made the surgery controlled and safe. And thus, it has uh, reduced the uh, rate of complications vastly, drastically. But however, say, having said that, persistent vitreous hemorrhage is the most common complication of diabetic vitrectomy. It is often seen within two months of surgery. And the older studies uh, done in the late 80s reported the incidence to be as high as nearly 75%. Uh, the diabetic retinopathy vitrectomy study, which was reported in uh, the late 80s and early 90s, the incidence was reported to be 24 to uh, 14 to 23%. But uh, the newer uh, studies uh, performed in, say, 2010, the incidence is much less now. It is about 10 to 16%. What are the risk factors which predispose for persistent vitreous hemorrhage? Now, young age is uh, thought to be one of the risk factors because uh, the older patients, they often have, uh, you know, sclerosed vessels and burnt out uh, retinopathy. Whereas, uh, uh, the young patients are likely to have, uh, likely to have dilated vessels which may bleed a lot. So, young uh, patients may have more risk of developing persistent vitreous hemorrhage. A uh, phakic status uh, also can, you know, predispose for persistent vitreous hemorrhage because it often precludes complete uh, clearance of the peripheral vitreous which can predispose to peripheral proliferation. And also later on, uh, after the surgery, there is a release of the RBCs from this large peripheral vitreous skirt. This can cause a persistent vitreous hemorrhage. Severity of retinopathy is also associated. The more severe retinopathy with large vascular prolips, the more, more chance that they may bleed postoperatively and can cause a persistent vitreous hemorrhage. And now this, if often we come across such a situation where you have large fibrovascular prolips, uh, highly vascular, which uh, which will tend to bleed, or at least the cut ends will tend to bleed. So you have to be careful. The role of laser, in an inadequate laser, either preoperatively or during the surgery, can also be a cause for persistent vitreous hemorrhage. And the gauge of vitrectomy. Now previously with 20 gauge uh, vitrectomy, uh, it was often uh, you know it was very common to have. Uh, sclerotomy related complications such as fibrovascular proliferations and anterior hyaloid proliferations which uh, led to persistent vitreous hemorrhage but but with the advent of the MIVS this incidence is much reduced and the sclerotomy related fibrovascular prolif uh, also is much reduced 
However, no difference has been seen among the you know MIBS gauges like 23 and 25. Probably all are uh, equal incidence. And comorbidities are the most important risk factors here. Now, comorbidities such as uncontrolled hypertension, end-stage kidney disease, cardiovascular disease, or patients who are on anticoagulants and antiplatelet agents or uh, blood dyscrasia, anemia, all these patients, they tend to bleed a lot because of the uh, you know imbalance in the coagulation uh, system. So these are at higher risk of developing persistent vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, the site for the persistent bleeding in 80% of cases, it is the sclerotomy site from where the fibrosculo proliferation will develop newly. But sometimes in the early postoperative period, there can be oozing from the cut ends of the prolips, which can cause persistent bleeding. And uh, rarely there can be a reproliferation on the retinal surface, which can also bleed. And how to how to prevent this uh, recurrent uh, persistent vitreous hemorrhage? Of course, prevention is the best method. So one must be you know extra careful during the surgery. Uh, clear the sclerotomy sites of all the vitreous. Uh, if there is a large peripheral vitreous uh, skirt, uh, trim it as much as possible and make it less. Cauterize all the bleeders immediately and don't let the bleeding blood blood get accumulated over the retina. Intermittently raise the infusion pressure so that you can control the surface bleeders. Uh, but before closing, uh, remember to lower the infusion pressure and identify the bleeders and cauterize them because otherwise you have a false sense of security saying that all the bleeders are well cauterized. Uh, you can also uh, put pressure on the surface bleeders with the blunt tip of the cutter or some blunt instrument and that can also cause uh, the bleeder to stop. And of course, it's very important to take care of the systemic status before you take up the patient for surgery. Uh, as I said, role of laser is very important. Uh, a a well-lasered retina preoperatively and also intraoperative laser has less chance of developing persistent vitreous hemorrhage. Role of anti-VEGF, uh, you can all agree with me that anti-VEGF has helped a lot in reducing intraoperative and perioperative bleeding. It is extremely effective. It is preferably, it is given about three to five days preoperatively. And it is de definitely preferred in situations where you have extensive or highly vascular proliferations. And some surgeons also use it as an intraoperative uh, tool to, at the end of the surgery, they like to give anti vegf agents, which may, which may help in, uh, you know, reducing the incidence of post-operative persistent vitreous hemorrhage. So, withholding anticoagulants, now this is a controversial topic. Uh, no significant association has been noted between anticoagulant and antiplatelet therapy and recurrent vitreous hemorrhage. And as such, many physicians do not advise discontinuation of the anticoagulant therapy before surgery. But I would suggest to the VR surgeon that it would be better to, you know, uh, take the decision in your hands and prudently decide for each and every case because you are the one who has to tackle the bleeding during surgery. And it would be uh, advisable to discontinue these agents uh, before surgery, especially if you have very high risk cases where you have large vascular proliferations because however careful you are, there might be some, you know, bleeding from the cut ends. So it would be better to take a decision in such a situation. Sometimes the anesthetist uh, would advise to do a coagulation screening test on the day of the surgery and then decide about the further plan. So these are situations where uh, I would definitely, you know, such situations where I would definitely stop the anticoagulant therapy before surgery and also give anti -vegip. So the more, you know, the more measures you take to reduce the bleeding, the better. So management depends. Uh, before management, you can do an ultrasound to make sure that the posterior segment is good, the retina is well attached. You can also do a UBM to identify whether there is any fibrovascular proliferation from the sclerotomy site, and it is very effective in uh, identifying this. Uh, so management observation is a good good enough option, uh, especially in cases where there is a early postoperative period patient has a recurrent vitreous hemorrhage. You can afford to wait and watch, or patients who are very sick and morbid patients who cannot undergo you know resurgery uh, in them also observation is a good option and often you wait for about one or two months the bleeding can spontaneously clear uh, without uh, resorting to any intervention but if the patient is very anxious and they require uh, early rehabilitation then you can intervene in form of either a fluid gas exchange which is done in the outpatient or in the ot or a vitreous lavage so how would you decide about uh, which uh, method to do that uh, generally what I do is I look at the ultrasound scan before the surgery. And if the ultrasound scan shows a lot of vitreous echoes towards the posterior uh, surface, like towards the retinal surface, uh, in that situation, the OPD fluid gas exchange might not be very useful because with OPD fluid gas exchange, you cannot actually clear the posterior fluid very well. 
you can clear the anterior fluid. So then in this situation, it would be better to do a vitreous lavage. So vitreous lavage, you can do a, a partial plan of vitrectomy, uh, whichever gauge you choose. I generally do 23 gauge. So you just use, a, after a switching on the infusion cannula, you use the fruit needle and just keep it under the uh, uh, pupillary area and aspirate the blood. So once the initial blood is cleared, you can see the view. And here you can see the pre-retinal hemorrhage has been removed. Uh, if the vitrectomy is done well, you don't need to do much of vitrectomy. But here you can see that there is a peripheral vitreous skirt, uh, which has some uh, you know bleeding inside. Uh, so that can be trimmed. And also look at the sclerotomy sites. Here you can see there is a lot of, uh, near the sclerotomy site, there is a lot of bleeding and fibrovascular proliferation. So it would be advisable to trim these fibrovascular proliferations and do either a cautery and also you can do cryo to these, these areas so that you know further attacks of uh, persistent vitreous hemorrhage are uh, prevented. So the take home message is persistent vitreous hemorrhage is common after vitrectomy, especially for diabetic retinopathy. The high risk characteristics include young age, phakic status, inadequate preoperative laser and comorbidities. Careful dissection of the membranes with immediate hemostasis and cauterization of the bleeding will help in prevention. anti vegfs are a very useful adjuncts and should be used uh, uh, whenever uh, necessary. And the uh, vitreous lavage with laser or cryo is the definitive treatment in such situations. So thank you very much for your fine attention. Uh, thank you, Dr. Dhanasri. It is, it is an excellently covered, well covered actually, in fact. So uh, I would like to you know ask a few questions to our panelists. Uh, uh, Dr. Ramandip, uh, your, the question to you is, so how, what should be your protocol of a uh, case of recurrent vitreous hemorrhage in case of adult versus pediatric? So uh, I think uh, Dr. Dhanashiri has covered most of the points, you know, uh, regarding the, uh, you know, the diabetic patients. Now I have a very, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't like a lens there. So in the kind of TRDs and uh, that ma'am as Dr. Atra has shown that I want a patient to be pseudophagic in all the patients. So uh, if, if they're pseudophagic, I can take care of anterior fibrovascular proliferation and I can I can prevent this uh, post-operative vitreous hemorrhage. But once the post-operative vitreous hemorrhage occurs in these eyes, if it's a phagic eye, I will observe for, you know, uh, four weeks and give one anti -VEGF. If it doesn't resolve, then I am doing... Uh, cataract surgery plus vitreous lavage together, you know, as, as one procedure. And if the patient is uh, pseudophagic, then again, I would like to observe for four weeks. And then I would like to give again one anti VEGF. If it doesn't respond, then I will go ahead with the vitreous lavage. But my main is to make the patient pseudophagic and complete my dissection. And this is your adult part. And for your, uh, you know, uh, the part uh, which is, you know, uh, the the uh, the pediatric cases uh, once with the vitreous hemorrhage. I think those are the circumstances where we see normally the patient with the trauma and uh, 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 and and so there I I I always try to uh, save the lens as much as possible. If there is a lens injury, I don't have any choice. Then I have to do it. Otherwise, uh, you know, uh, uh, normally. Uh, these children, uh, uh, they don't, they don't, uh, they don't bleed like uh, diabetic do. This is what I have to say actually. Yeah. Yeah. True. true. Very true. I mean, I mean, this is the practical parts. I mean, uh, sometimes do you uh, do you find that the PVD induction is sometimes difficult in in pediatric cases, and because of the peripheral, if there is untrimmed some amount of the vitreous, which can cause a tear and can lead to vitreous hemorrhage. Yep, uh, you're right, but uh, these, uh, uh, these, 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 sorry. I think Rupak is stuck uh, mid sentence. Yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Ramandip, you are completing your answer. No, I, I didn't get it, question actually. Uh, uh, Dr. Rupan was talking about uh, the inability to remove the vitreous in the periphery in a pediatric age group <laughs> and the possibility of tears in a later stage. Yeah, uh, you know, in, in, in a in, in a fake eye, you know, when you are doing a uh, vitrectomy with the depression, most of the times you are able to see the uh, the the breaks while it, uh, removing the uh, PVD. But sometimes it, it does happen. But uh, if with a careful scleral depression, you are able to pick them intraoperatively only. Yeah. So, uh, 
So we are just running a little behind, but uh, another, uh, Dr. Unni, maybe we can take another question for this. So uh, is there any, uh, uh, would like to ask uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Shavit Chawla. Uh, Dr. Chawla, in case of recurrent vitreous hemorrhage, do you think uh, any any role of you know putting silicon oil in those kind of cases to prevent further recurrence? That would not be my first approach. Especially in diabetic? No, I, that would not be my first approach. I would rather resort to a peripheral mm -hmm. cryopexy. Uh, in a, and trimming of the vitreous base nicely, as Dr. Uh, Dhanachri demonstrated. Yes, if the situation is bad and the patient is only I, a temporary silicon tamponade for some time can be considered. But it is not a first-line approach. The first-line approach is always to detect the cause and treat it. Thank and, you, sir. Uh, using uh, anterior retinal cryopexy in these cases. Uh, I totally agree with Ramandeep also on the point that it's pseudo fake eye. I also tend to do combined surgeries in diabetics a lot is a much better approach where there are anterior fibrovascular proliferations and the risk of bleeds, recurrent bleeds are less. So I feel prevention is better, but when you have a situation you should try and go in, remove the peripheral vitreous, look at the cause and do a, as much peripheral laser ablation as possible. If not, then use some cryopexy, especially at the behind the sclerotomy sites. Because I feel even in MIVS, we can have associated fibrovascular proliferation developing at these sclerotomy sites. Thank you, Dr. Shobhat. I think uh, we have to uh, thank you, Dr. Rathra, for the wonderful talk. I think we have to go to the next uh, the next talk, and I'd like to uh, yeah. So, Dr. Naresh has uh, Dr. Naresh from uh, the Aravindai Hospital, Madurai. He's a, a very excellent surgeon, and uh, uh, I've heard his lucid talks, which are very impressive. Always with a quip of humor inside to keep everybody on their toes. And Dr. Naresh will be talking to us about the management and triage of patients with uh, vitreous hemorrhage in trauma. Over to you, Dr. Naresh. You're on uh, mute, Dr. Naresh. Yeah, I did tell you, I did tell you uh, Dr. Tony. His sense of humor is excellent. I mean, we are yes. all so so eager I... to hear that. Yeah, everything is fine, I think. So if something is wrong, you please stop me, whether if you cannot see me or the slides or cannot hear. Actually, the best way to manage a case of uh, trauma is uh, sending the case to your competitor. That's what I used to say. And the best way of uh, giving a topic to a person with, a, I mean, if you want to give, no, you give this trauma topic to your competitor so that you can put him in trouble. It's just on the lighter note because it's very difficult most of the time. So first, I would like to thank Dr. Uh, uh, Muthukrishnan for helping me in making this. All the other speakers are very lucky because when they talk about the vitreous hemorrhage, the vitreous hemorrhage is confined to only the vitreous cavity. Unlike trauma, you will have all the problem. You will have problem right from the cornea to the lid to the sclera to the optic nerve. So when you come to a question, I mean, the cases of a vitreous hemorrhage due to trauma, it is full of surprises. And it is one of the commonest cause of vitreous hemorrhage in active young people. And it is very difficult to manage these cases because we've got a lot of uh, diagnostic dilemma as well as management dilemmas. And the most important thing is, unlike the vitreous MRI due to most other causes, it's very difficult to prognosticate to the patient because they have a lot of expectation. The patients are very young and we have to talk to them in groups uh, when we are counseling them. That's very, very important. And assessment of light perception uh, usually uh, done regularly gives a wrong perception that the patient is having NLP because no light perception is not a contraindication for doing uh, any surgery or vitreous surgery in case of trauma because close to 25 to 30 percent of the patients who are uh, uh, NLP preoperatively after surgery can have uh, PLR better vision. And we have to do a complete uh, battery of uh, investigation in all these cases of traumatic because every case of uh, traumatic VH or trauma is a potential case of medical legal uh, case. So we have to do a complete investigation. So as I was telling, unlike other cases, so we'll have surprises right from the conjunctive. This is a case which was operated uh, 
yesterday following trauma it was a pseudophic guy you can see a pseudophic cell and the patient had uh, uh, i mean the the corneal uh, scleral wound uh, given way patient has got supracoroidal hemorrhage along with vitreous hemorrhage and retinal detachment we are waiting for next uh, 10 15 days for the supracoroidal hemorrhage to lie so that we can drain and go for the surgery usually we do in stage surgery so as i have already told it compasses all the other uh, organs of the eye right from the cornea to the lens to the retina and in fact uh, we are in uh, okay single specialty eye hospital so that uh, we rarely come across uh, the cases with the head injury or uh, uh, blast injury we get most of the time a clear a clean uh, what do you call orbital or the ocular injuries but whatever it may be we need a complete coordination with other specialties like cornea or orbit or even cataract because uh, they can do a better job when they are repairing the corneal wound than us so when you want you are evaluating you have to evaluate the vision accurately especially the projection of rays as well as the perception of light is important absence of pl is not at all a contraindication or it is not an indication for enucleation i'll show you in one of the cases what has happened because even in the absence of pl the globe is still salvageable please don't go for uh, urgent enucleation in this cases somehow uh, some of our uh, colleague and other specialties have a habit of enucleating and you have to look for the RAPD consensual reflex in the fellow eye if it uh, is also very important. And as I was, uh, as it was earlier discussed, the fellow eye is important because my professor also used to say most of the children who come with trauma usually have, have some sort of refractive error, so we'll have to take care of that. And X-ray orbit in all cases of trauma is mandatory. X-ray PA view is very, very important because for medical legal purpose, X-ray has to be done not only to rule out foreign body, uh, just for our, uh, I mean, uh, safety. This can, is a wonderful tool. Uh, many people will say it will expulse the contents. Very rarely it does. If the integrity is okay, don't give the pressure. And it gives us the details of the collateral damage, whether the patient has got a dislocated lens or the patient has got a retinal detachment or hemorrhage, all those collateral damage. CT scan is very useful nowadays. We have made it mandatory for all foreign bodies because uh, precise localization of the foreign body is uh, better with the CT scan. And if you rule out metallic foreign body, then you can go for uh, MRI. Because in the presence of a metallic foreign body, the, if you do a MRI, the foreign body can move almost 7 to 10 millimeters in the, inside the eye during this uh, procedure and can lead to a lot of damage to the eyes. So this is what I was telling. It's very unpredictable. So anything can coexist right from the globe rupture, the uh, intraocular foreign body, vitreous hemorrhage, luxation of lens, everything can be seen. It's not a simple vitreous hemorrhage which will be coming across in most of the trauma cases. But in simple cases, it's fine. So in one of the papers from Elu Prasad, they have operated with a, uh, what do you call, uh, bad cornea with endoscopy. So they found actually vitreous hemorrhage to be uh, present in 30% of these cases, foreign body in 13% uh, of these cases. And in one of this largest uh, prospective trial from UK, so you can find that uh, which is uh, hemorrhage is one of the most, uh, what do you call, uh, prognosticating factor with uh, uh, poor visual, visual outcome. And uh, in, there is a controversy in this paper, right? They said actually treating the patient at the end of the surgery with uh, thiamcinolone intravitreal as well as uh, uh, Subtiran uh, gives a better prognosis, but we have never tried because most of our cases will be having a fungal uh, uh, infection along with this trauma. So I will have some uh, case scenario. This is a six months infant. The patient had, a, the child had a trauma due to fall from the cr cradle and it was uh, diagnosed with a bilateral Tursen syndrome. Probably this is the youngest of the Tursens I have seen. So... Usually, in order to avoid the damage to the lens, because we don't have a, what do you call 2 mm cannula, so I use a, what do you call a spacer that is a 42 band cut into small pieces. I use it as the spacer so that will not be touching the lens. And in all these Tursen's cases, you can find the vitreous hemorrhage becomes a de hemoglobinized quite early. So after cutting the vitreous, and uh, the in induction of PUD is very difficult in all these persons because most of the patients are very young. And sub-ILM hemorrhage over the macula is uh, seen in almost all cases of person. So in addition to doing a vitrectomy and a complete uh, PUD induction, so we have to go for the ILM pill. So you can find actually there is a thin uh, ILM and thin film of blood under the ILM. 
So usually we peel the ILM in all cases of, uh, yeah, you can make out. So this is a sub-ILM bleed in case of tersens. And usually no tamponade is required in these cases because otherwise these cases are very clean. So we don't need any tamponade. Maybe air is fine. Unless otherwise we damage any of the peripheral retina while doing the vitreous uh, uh, surgery. So this patient had a trauma with a fist while playing this school. And he had an open globe injury with a scleral tear repair done elsewhere. The biggest problem with these cases is when it is done, I think most of the time we come across the retina suture to the scleral wound. So this is the case, the patient had vitreous hemorrhage. Fortunately, he was lucky. Uh, there was only uh, the remnants of lens matter. You can see the sutured uh, corneal, I mean, sorry, the scleral wound. So we avoided the area of the scleral wound. We went inside the vitreous cavity. And this is one of uh, the luckiest patients whom I have operated, even though it appears very bad anteriorly, but uh, inside the eye, it was very clean. Only vitreous hemorrhage could be seen with uh, the lens, do, I mean, remnant in the anterior uh, chamber. Uh, we have not placed the SFIOL or the second IOL in this case We want, because uh, we didn't know what is going to be there in the macula, whether the patient is having a, a post berlin sedima degeneration or any damage to the macula. So we have reserved the second IOL in this case for a later surgery. So the remnant, the remnant of the lens matter was uh, removed in these cases. You can see in these cases, the blood uh, dehemoglobinizes is quite fast. And after clearing everything and after doing an uh, pupiloplasty, we went inside. Fortunately, this uh, boy had a very good retina. No peripheral uh, lesions were seen. So we just, uh, we didn't do the laser also. We just left it. And uh, we are planning for secondary will maybe sometimes later. This patient had a trauma with axe. You can find that there is a rigid uh, lens uh, in this, uh, I mean, the rigid retina in this ultrasound. And this was a 15th post-op day. And patient had superocoroidal uh, uh, hemorrhage and uh, CDs also. So because eyeball was very soft, we were injecting the fluid in one eye and then we were uh, uh, releasing. So after doing the vitrectomy, usually I do in stages these cases, you can find a dense vitreous hemorrhage in these cases. Uh, where sometimes when we are using 25 gauge, the problem is uh, uh, the vitreous hemorrhage clocks and uh, we have to change the cutter. When I saw actually the entire uh, temporal retina was folded and it was sutured to the nasal retina. So after doing a retinectomy, there were folds in the retina. So a PFCL was injected and uh, the ILM was peeled and the rest of the remnant uh, vitreous was uh, care carefully uh, removed. And usually in these cases uh, with uh, some supracoroidal hemorrhage or uh, hemorrhage, I mean, uh, serious uh, supracoroidal fluid, uh, we do a stage surgery. So we do a PFCL injection and uh, topped up with silicon oil. So we leave this uh, uh, PFCL inside the eye for a week or 10 days. So after 10 days later, this patient underwent the second stage surgery. We removed the silicon oil and the PFCL, did the endolaser. And then this is the outcome of the patient. The patient after 30th post-op day, and this is after the... Uh, 90th post of day, still we have retained the oil with a 624 vision. And another common thing is we don't give any, I mean, uh, uh, concern for, uh, we don't have any concern for this uh, workers. No, nobody wears the protective glasses. So this is uh, one of the cases with a penetrating injury with the hammer and chisel. Hammer and chisel, we know like intraoptal problem, but it's very common in, in our part of the country. The patient had traumatic uh, cataract traumatic vitreous hemorrhage, but when I went inside the eye, I was surprised because it was a large foreign body. It was literally standing like uh, what you call Eiffel Tower over the uh, optic nerve head. So I don't know whether to remove because the uh, I mean, visual prognosis is bad, but we cannot retain the foreign body inside. So, and we cannot remove such a large foreign body through the scleral wound. So in these cases, we sacrifice the lens. In fact, we have already sacrificed. And we want to remove the lens through the trans uh, limbal route. So after a complete vitrectomy and PVD induction, we, use, uh, we still have a reserve of 20 gauge instruments with us. They are all very useful in these cases, even though they are in the museum. At times we bring them. The only mistake I personally feel I have done is going in for a, a tri -planner. In these cases, a clear uh, limbal section would have been better because uh, Negotiating the foreign body in this uh, situation will be much easier. So you can find out. 
along with the foreign body, there is some detachment which was settled later. You can find such a huge foreign body along the vitreous amine in these cases. As I was telling, if it would have been a clear uh, limbal wound, it would have been easier, but uh, because it's a, uh, what do you call it, a triplanar, it was a bit difficult in removing, but anyway, we have removed it. It's such a large foreign body. How it entered and exactly went over the optic nerve head. And this is a routine case with a small foreign body, but uh, still uh, in all these cases, uh, we have to do a complete vitrectomy. And I usually do the PVD injection at the end of the surgery because when we are removing the foreign body, it's better to retain some vitreous. Even if they fall over the macula, there'll be some cushioning effect. And the most important the clue while removing the foreign body is uh, making the, what do you call the, the foreign body aligned uh, perpendicular to the sclera so that it will not get stuck when you are removing it. So always align your foreign body, uh, what do you call? Because this extracular magnet was quite okay. So I didn't uh, have the patience to exchange the instrument, but anyhow, the foreign body came and uh, then we switched it. This is another important case which I would like to share. Uh, I'll skip that. This patient uh, underwent a firecracker injury and he underwent scleral uh, I mean tear repair with complexated lens. So in this case, we did, uh, along with the vitreous hemorrhage, the patient had a uh, retinal detachment also. So we'll have uh, not only vitreous hemorrhage, we get uh, a complete, uh, what do you call, a spectrum of uh, damage to the eye in this case, uh, I mean, in most of these cases. So as I was telling, no PL or a flat tire sign is not a contraindication for uh, repair or uh, you don't go for uh, enucleation. This is a 46-year-old male. He was referred with the diagnosis of globe uh, perforation and uh, after uh, what you call injury with the stick. And he had a cataract surgery 18 months ago. And uh, this was anti-segment finding and our colleagues, uh, this was uh, the flat tire you can find in the CT. So our colleagues said we'll go for uh, enucleation, but we went for, uh, instead of uh, listening to them, we went for the wound exploration and repair. So this is the POD1, the eyeball nicely formed with the retinal detachment with the suprachoroidal hemorrhage. And then this was the 14th post-op day of the same patient. Okay, so this is the patient whom we operated, the same patient. So those days we used to have six millimeter cannula, so that way it's very fine. This patient had suprachoroidal hemorrhage, as well as the suprachoroidal hemorrhage was drained. So I usually drain the suprachoroidal hemorrhage by putting a 23 non valve cannula, usually 10 to 13 millimeters posterior to the limbus, not anteriorly, so that uh, it is easy for us to drain most of the blood. And if it is on both the sides, we do that. So this you can find a non valve cannula, 10 millimeters posterior to the limbus, literally draining all the fluid. But in this case, it has not completely done its job. So after, uh, uh, yeah. With your surgery, you can still find the nasal uh, supraocular hemorrhage still persisting. So as I told earlier, so we all do these stages in, uh, I mean, surgery in stages. And many a times we all tell the patient that the traumatic patients will have to go multiple surgery under GA. So we have also told this patient that he will require multiple surgery. But fortunately, this is the second stage of the surgery. But still, there is uh, some amount of... Uh, uh, Supracoroidal hemorrhage still persisting, but still we went ahead exchanging the PFCL and the silicon oil with uh, uh, fluid air exchange, laser and silicon oil. After the second stage, this was the outcome of this patient. He would uh, gain some 624 vision or something like that over a period of time. So uh, we have got a lot of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, what do you call, uh, literature, uh, which says that uh, what are all the prognosticating factors. The recent one, I'll say, this is the one which is published in the month of September. It's a very good uh, uh, article which says, uh, uh, talks about the guideline of the treatment of the patient with uh, trauma with no perception of light uh, in this case. And they have told actually, uh, two things any case which comes with trauma do a primary repair within 24 hours and uh, the best time for uh, what you call the vitrectomy is uh, uh, three to 14 days after the injury because we can have a, an automatic uh, what you call the pvd induction and uh, there will not be much of uh, pvr in these cases but uh, however if there is a foreign body if there is any infection or endophthalmitis or retinal detachment early surgery is always mandated 
And as I told, exploration of anti segment should be done within 12 to 24 hours. And uh, counseling is very important in all these cases. Counsel them in groups because we cannot uh, talk to them individually. Talk about multiple surgery requirement for it. these people, and they may. Rec I mean, uh, at the end of the good surgery, they may still end up with bad vision. So, in all these cases of trauma, the poor prognosticating factors are globe rupture, especially with more than ten millimeter. Usually, the prognosis is uh, bad. Uh, retention of uh, intraocular foreign body, it's a poor prognosticating factor. But however, if the foreign body is small and if it's not damaging mechanically the macula, usually that outcome is good. Zone 3 Im images, any wound more than 10 millimeters, prolapse of retina and choroid and vitreous in the wound is a very bad uh, uh, prognosticating factor. And if we delay the primary repair for more than 20, after 24 hours, then it is going to give a very bad uh, prognosis. Lens damage, somehow it's a bit controversial because uh, in one of the cases where we have done the lensectomy, the posterior segment was, apart from vitreous hemorrhage, everything was fine. So lens damage is not always a very bad uh, prognosticating factor, in my opinion. If there is a ciliary body damage or if there is a severe intraocular or supracoroidal hemorrhage that causes uh, poor visual outcome, PVR, of course, presence of RD and especially with the CD or presence of RAPD or traumatic endophthalmitis, all this leads to poor prognosticating factors in any of these uh, I mean, um, cases. So in summary, when we come across uh, vitreous hemorrhage, as I have told already, please send it to some of your competitors. Better not to uh, repair actually ourselves because it's very difficult to answer the patients. And the cause of, uh, I mean, uh, vitreous hemorrhage in these cases can be uh, various, right from the rupture of the vessels. And uh, when you operate, it's very difficult because you can have a lot of uh, comorbid pathologies like RDR, CDR, intraocular foreign body. A prompt exploration followed by PPV can be a vision salvaging. No PL in these cases is not at all a contraindication. And even if there is a flat tire sign, give a chance by doing a wound repair. So as uh, we always say, a stitch in time saves time. So when the patient comes with an open wound, as early as possible, we'll stitch it. And the last and the final thing which I want to tell is all our trauma cases, irrespective of the age group, we take it under the general anesthesia because we don't know how long we are going to operate. So all our cases of trauma, except for small foreign bodies, which we can see with indirect, and it's not going to be that difficult, except for those cases, all our cases are taken under general anesthesia. That is our dictum. And with that, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much. Uh Thank you, Dr. Naresh. Uh, the talk was exhaustive and interesting, so interesting. We forgot to caution you regarding the time, but uh, all of us probably enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to pose a question to Dr. Parveen uh, regarding uh, one of the points he has touched regarding uh, the timing of... I think we are not muted. I am... Uh, I'm... You can hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah, Dr. Parveen, regarding... Uh, Nothing is... Your voice is getting muffled. You can't hear me? We can hear you, Nee. Oh, okay. Fine, fine. So, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I mean... We can hear you, Nee. It's very clear. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Yeah, better. So, uh, the, uh, just uh, to Dr. Parveen, regarding... Just stressing on the point of the timing of hmm. vitreous surgery in uh, post-trauma. Dr. Naresh has talked about it. Like your take on the matter also. Yes, usually the um, first uh, lot of good collection of cases that Dr. Naresh has shown, and I was probably jotting down a few points which came to my mind as he was uh, uh, going through his cases. But to answer your question first, so traditionally we have all been uh, told about this uh, 7 to 14 days period when we is the best time to go in. But there are certain exceptions. I think when you see an intraocular foreign body, you may not want to wait. But even then, it is good to see the corneal condition. If you think that the corneal condition could improve uh, by waiting one or two days, I think it will still be worthwhile to wait. DVD induction, yes, it does happen to some extent. So here you are walking a thin line to, to take a balance between uh, immediate intervention vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, uh, uh, not deferred, don't send the patient home and call after one month, you will not know what is what. But, you know, watchful uh, waiting so that you can enter at a good period of time. And in the time when you are waiting, a uh, serial ultrasound should be done. Look out for endophthalmitis if it is a penetrating injury. All those things must be kept in mind if you are not intervening right away. 
and um, just to add one or two points to the cases which dr nareesh uh, shared that six month old patient with tersen syndrome was really interesting and i uh, have done a few and i think i have burnt my hands the uh, most important thing to look for is in post operative ghost cell glaucoma because you cannot remove the vitreous completely and lot of uh, vitreous hemorrhage is left behind this causes it uh, the glaucoma should definitely be looked after and immediate post operative uh, may need anti glaucoma treatment till all the rest of the vit uh, vitreous which you have left gets absorbed then there was another uh, thing where a lot of uh, vitreous hemorrhage is there which precludes your view and you are not able to proceed in those cases i think um, uh, uh, even in post diabetes interphase vitrectomy you can just start your fluid gas exchange it helps to clear and you can proceed further i'm personally very fond of interior entry through the limbus when i don't see anything especially with an ac maintainer that saves you a lot of uh, problem because there's so much of vitreous hemorrhage especially in post trauma is you don't know where the uh, vitreous is ending where the retina is starting so if you are anyway go to sacrifice the lens as we saw in some of his cases you can go with the ac maintainer so i hope i've answered your question also uni and i've quickly put in a few of the points which i wanted to add to the excellent collection of cases by dr naresh thank you uh, do we have any more uh, comments or uh, points to note from our panel uh, uni i have a question like everybody does under general anesthesia or uh, anybody does under local anesthesia of all these trauma cases what uh, the anesthesia because i said uh, for us it's a ga which is preferred for irrespective of the age group right from 6 months to 7 months to 77 years we have operated under the ga i think so, most of us do case to case basis if it's a very old patient then ga is more uh, traumatic and more morbid associated morbidities it's not a total contraindication initially it used to be yes but i think now uh, sometimes we are able to uh, do our local anesthesia also lot of our cases i think dr naresh you define the cases which can be done under ada very well uh, yeah. i think rest of the cases deserve ga because you have to be prepared for a lot of eventualities which may occur and the surgery may be long drawn totally agree with your where you can are able to see a simple foreign body and you are you know it's going to be a short procedure is different Uh, just to add on, sorry, Rupak, just basically to add on, when you're sure exactly what you're going to do, steps are defined, you can try local, but you anticipate or you're not sure exactly how long going to do damage you are not so aware of, I think GA would be better. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pramodhan. I would just like to add that when there is a doubt of the structural integrity after the primary wound repair and you're going again, those are the patients where obviously you cannot uh, tighten the orbital uh, with anesthetic and maybe a GA is uh, much more. That is, could be one more indication where you don't go in for a local anesthesia where there is any doubt about the structural integrity after primary repair. Uh, thank you, Dr. Narish. That was an extremely uh, interesting uh, group of videos and your talk was well uh, organized. Uni, I just wanted to add one thing. Sorry. Yes. No, no, for the GA, usually it is... You know, if you can do the surgery in one sitting, uh, in these trauma cases, the results are, I feel, is much better. So, going ahead, that's one reason we prefer to go with the GA because just in case you need to prolong the surgery and do the entire procedure in one sitting, uh, a GA would be much better. That's another reason why we would choose. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yeah, I think we are running and the, the watches are giving us a tick, tick, tick. So, uh, uh, I think out of those all vitreous hemorrhages, so if you have a, a vitreous hemorrhage who has a diabetic retinopathy background, which is the most common scenario which we do come across for all our you know, general practice, especially for the gel ophthalmologist. Now, I would like to invite to talk on this vitreous hemorrhage when you have a diabetic diabetic background. So for that, I would like to invite Dr. Rajiv Jain, uh, Director of, of Safe Site Center, uh, and again, an excellent clinician and uh, great academician. 
Dr. Dr. Rajiv, over to you. Yes, sir. Sir, am I audible? Yes, you are, Rajiv. You are very audible. Yes, very much. Very much. Sir, I have shared my screen. Uh, I hope my screen is visible now. Not yet. Not yet. Is it all right now, sir? Yeah, yeah. it's all Rajiv, yes. Yeah. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, uh, apologies for joining in late. I've been in Retina Summit here in Goa. So over to uh, you from Goa. So uh, I'll start with the case. This is a case who came uh, with the total vitreous hemorrhage in the left eye. And right eye had some background uh, diabetic changes, few macroaneurysms, a uh, few heart exudates elsewhere. And there was some go to the slide view, please. Uh, slide view mode. So, this is what I have done. This is slide view, isn't it? And not that. No, not this is not slide view. Full, full screen, full screen. So, at, at my end, I can see the whole, you know. At my end, it's. Uh, Are you seeing? Can you uh, unshare some, some it again? again? Sorry? Can you unshare it and then make it uh, full view and share it again? Okay, I'll do that. Zoom back to meeting. That's a problem. I have stopped it, sir. Uh, just uh, make it for uh, just uh, make it in the presenter's view and then do the reshare. On, you just have to go to uh, slideshow and make it uh, on on the, on the top you, or or on the bottom, whichever way you want to. So I am. Uh, you just go to slideshow. Just go to next to it. Next to it. Yeah, next next to next animation. Yes. Yes. The slideshow. So the slideshow. Click on it. You need to click on it, doctor. You share. No, no, not on the on the presentation. There is a uh, uh, menu called uh, slideshow. No, no, you were there. Right? Yes, right? yes, you yes, there. yes. Just, yes. just by the side of animation only. But your cursor was there. Yes, yes, yes. Just yes. by left, left, left to that, left to that. Doctor, can you just on the horizontal? You can just see from there? just there is animation, then there is slideshow. Right, right on to just, just, slide just slide right. right. Yes, uh, yes. Yes. Slideshow from beginning. beginning. From beginning. Is it better from, now? Yes, thank. You. This is uh, apologies. I'm so sorry. I'm new to this. Uh, MacBook, so I'm so sorry. Please kindly <laughs> bear with me. Thanks. So I'll uh, start with the case. Uh, this is a case came with the total vitreous hemorrhage with some background diabetic changes and some history of laser in the past six months ago. And we thought uh, we did ultrasound and uh, uh, everything appeared fine. And uh, after two weeks, we did the surgery. And to our surprise, what we found? We found uh, the patient had a racemose hemangioma, which had bled. So with this background, what I want to say is when a diabetic patient comes in, he may not be having just a proliferative diabetic retinopathy, which is causing vitreous hemorrhage. You have to rule out all other causes, the proliferative retinopathy causes, as well as non-proliferative retinopathy causes. We must remember the commonest cause, two most commonest cause in a patient, in an adult patient or old patient are proliferative diabetic retinopathy and PVD associated vitreous hemorrhage, which can be with or without tear. So the vitreous hemorrhage can happen from abnormal uh, blood vessels, like in diabetic retinopathy, where there is new vascularization, or it can happen from rupture of normal vessels, like retinal tears, post trauma, and uh, uh, retinal vascular tear during PVD. And old patients, they can have macroaneurysms or they can have PEHCR, which can lead to vitreous hemorrhage. So all these things we have to keep in mind. History plays an important part uh, wherein we can reach some diagnosis, like history of previous eye checkups, whether the patient had diabetic changes or not in the past, systemic history like hypertension to rule out any vascular occlusions or macroanisms, sickle cell disease. So this history is not important just for uh, diagnosing. It is more important for uh, planning the management as well like history of trauma, previous fundus photographs, OCDs, and previous history of injections in the eye. 
Examination includes best corrected visual acuity, IOP. Don't forget to uh, examine the entire segment very well because a lot of times we just, uh, being uh, post-segment surgeons, we just start with indirect and later on we do the uh, uh, slit lab examination when we think that there may, some, there may be something which we might be missing like NVI or new vessels in angles. Uh, cataract, uh, which uh, uh, which may help you in deciding us in deciding the management and the pupillary dilatation. Most of the time, the clue to the cause of vitreosemia and disease eye is given by the checkup of the better eye. And posterior segment evaluation, if it's a total vitreous hemorrhage, a lot of times we are able to see superior periphery. And if uh, the vitreous hemorrhage is not complete, we might be able to see areas of vascular occlusion, vasculitis and peripheral break. If possible, it's always better to see whether the vitreous hemorrhage is uh, just preretinal, intraretinal, and subretinal, because if it's just, it is present in all the, these three planes, then most probably it's a bleed from macroanism. So as I said, the most commonest uh, two causes are PDR and tear, but vascular occlusions, PVD, and sickle cell disease uh, are other causes which we should keep in mind, even if the patient is diabetic. And age-wise also, if the children comes, trauma is the commonest cause. Tursen syndrome, sir has shown very uh, good cases. In aged people, uh, PVD, diabetic retinopathy, vascular occlusions, and uh, breakthrough bleed in wet air MD. Investigations of choice includes uh, B-scan, FFA, and OCT. Uh, B-scan uh, of the eye in which there is a hemorrhage, and FFA and OCT, if possible, to pick some clues through the hemorrhage, and to find something uh, which is brewing in the other eye as well. So case of vitreous hemorrhage with the RD, where we could see, so this will uh, decide on the timing of the vitrectomy. Another case, a diabetic patient was referred to us uh, for uh, uh, diabetic vitreous hemorrhage. And uh, uh, this is the patient of CLL. And uh, this, this is not uh, diabetic vitreous hemorrhage. This is retinal hemorrhages and uh, white uh, centered hemorrhages which is because of leukemia. And if we can get some uh, angiography pictures, we can actually see good NVD and NVs on the other eye. Some clue from the other eye, if you uh, get laser marks, that means already been lasered. Another case where uh, dense vitreous hemorrhage is there, but we can actually make uh, NVE at the edge of normal looking retina and the hemorrhage. So what are the complications of vitreous hemorrhage? If we leave vitreous hemorrhage unattended, it causes uh, visual disability for which patient has uh, come to us. There can be uh, background proliferative retinopathy progression if we don't uh, treat the patient on time. If we have missed a break, then there, ca there can be retinal detachment. And of course, glaucoma related to vitreous hemorrhage like ghost cell glaucoma, hemosiderotic glaucoma, and hemolytic glaucoma. Another important thing which I have come across is, I think, uh, 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 is myopic shift in refraction after vitreous hemorrhage in infants. This was something which was new to me, which I had never thought. And for, for preparing this uh, presentation, I only come across this. So this is also significant that uh, will determine the timing of uh, vitrectomy in uh, children and infants. And the management option, it depends on the natural history and prognosis as well as the disease entity. Non-proliferative diseases usually have a better prognosis than proliferative retinopathies like cases of uh, trauma or uh, PVD associated uh, hemorrhages. They, uh, the uh, natural history is better and the prognosis is better. And as all of us know that clearance of blood from the vitreous is a slow process with a time constant in the order of 1% per day. Subhaloid hemorrhages, they absorb earlier than the vitreous hemorrhage because they are in direct touch with the retina. Management option remains if... Uh, there is adequate visualization. We can go ahead with panretinal photocoagulation uh, for as much as possible before planning surgery if the blood doesn't disappear in time or barrage the uh, break which we can see. Role of anti vegf combination therapy and pass planar vitrectomy. I'll come uh, in later part of the vitrectomy. So if the patient comes with the vitreous hemorrhage, we do dilated uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy with the adequate indentation. If we are able to uh, find out any break, you laser the break, or if it's not laserable, but you can still see it, it's always better to cryo the break and keep the patient under follow. If it's a proliferative disease, again, it depends on uh, the cause. Uh, you can do FFA, you can do laser. 
and if no cause is found and you think that retina is attached on ultrasound you can uh, keep uh, i personally keep these patients on uh, two weeks follow as uh, one of the picture is showing the patient has uh, bleed and uh, already lasered earlier a fresh uh, a prp laser was done in this case another eye which had a retinal tear for which vitreous hemorrhage was there and we did the barrage laser these are just so vitrectomy why do we need vitrectomy in these cases if there is a detachment and vitreous hemorrhage there is no doubt we have to go inside so these are the cases where we have to do urgent vitrectomy if there is a trd which is involving or threatening the macula if it's a total hemorrhage ultrasound is the key and that's why we have to be with the technician who is doing the ultrasound uh, to see the changes many a times uh, in the busy clinic we miss Uh, the findings because we don't go personally to see uh, what's happening uh, while the technician is doing the ultrasound. Uh, I make sure that I am there if I am suspecting a detachment or if uh, I am not able to see any part of the retina. Factors determining uh, approach: When do you go for early vitrectomy as compared to the late vitrectomy? If it's a proliferative cause and if there is a new vessels, I normally go for early vitrectomy. If it's a non-proliferative cause and the retina is attached, you can wait. children and young adults uh, you can go for early vitrectomy and old age you can normally wait if the duration of hemorrhage is more than 4 uh, uh, weeks uh, to 6 weeks we i always go for vitrectomy and if it is less than 4 weeks let's say a hemorrhage which is 2 uh, weeks old or 3 weeks old we like to observe and keep them on serial ultrasound if the fundus is non visible so <clears throat> regarding diaptic vitrectomy uh the drvs drvs uh, the study said that you can wait for 6 months if it is a type 2 uh, diabetic patient and there is a hemorrhage and uh, within 2 months if it's type 1 um, diabetic but the timeline is shrinking because of the better uh, instrumentation and our uh, uh, better we have more well versed to the techniques now our results are getting much much better so timing of the vitrectomy for us is that attachment is urgent if patient has nvi or nva i am not able to do the laser i go in for vitrectomy type 1 diabetes as well as the type 2 diabetes 1 to 2 months if it's a subhaloid vitreous hemorrhage which is not getting reabsorbed better to go in at 1 month because there is always uh, uh, formation of erm in these cases and it's always better to go in and remove the blood so interesting concept is anti vegf uh, they re reduces the level of uh, vegf and regress new vascularization and we most of us give 2 uh, to 3 days prior to the surgery and we wait for 5 uh, to 7 days uh, a lot of people wait for 5 to 7 days before going in and uh, various cochrane reviews have shown that uh, uh, the rate of post operative vitreous cavity hemorrhage is much less if uh, intra op uh, pre op uh, uh, anti vegfs have been used and intra op bleeding is also reduced so why uh, controversy about uh, using vegf so we must understand there is a balance of vegf and uh, ctgf within the vitreous cav cavity connective tissue growth factor it, it increases the fibrosis whereas vascular endothelial growth factor it decreases the fibrosis that is how the balance is maintained so once we have injected vegf so ctgf has more concentration in the vitreous and it causes fibrosis and because of fibrosis there is more traction if there is a, a trd uh, which can threat which is threatening the macula it can actually involve the macula and uh, so that is why uh, whenever we inject we always tell our patients you decide at day of the surgery then only i'll inject and decide on the day of the injection so that uh, uh, there is no increased traction before you go in few cases uh, post op uh, uh, vitrectomy was done the bad cases uh, some cases do well some cases do uh, bad but yes the timing and uh, the intent should be uh, good with small gauge vitrectomy we have obvious advantages and the goal of diabetic vitrectomy removes uh, is uh, to remove all the anterior and posterior traction as well as tangential traction maintain the hemostasis and uh, try to prevent recurrences so in eyes with complete pvd with no traction it's very simple you go in you uh, go in just remove the vitreous there is uh, do a good peripheral check do the endo laser put air 
and in eyes with the fibrovascular proliferations and TRD, we use all these techniques of segmentation, delamination, and block. So they, <clears throat> there is no what could technique. It's always a combination of all these techniques which we use in all these cases. Uh, try to uh, reduce bleeding as much as possible and remove all these stuffs with the cutter. The, adv the advantage of 23 gauge uh, or 25 gauge is that the cutting port is uh, near the end. So a lot of times you don't need uh, uh, scissors for removing these membranes and uh, this instrumentation has made our life easier. I remember uh, in uh, when we were actually uh, learning at that time with 20 gauge uh, uh, instrumentation, it used to be long surgeries. Now the duration of surgery has been reduced because of all this. The cutters work very well. I somehow not able to control the, uh, because uh, the surgeries, uh, all of you are much more senior and much better surgeons than me. I so <laughs> I was thinking I'll show lesser of the surgeries. I'll just quickly forward them. And I, uh, I'll just skip this part. Bimanual vitrectomy has definitely made our life easier. And with the advent of good chandelier lights, bimanual vitrectomy has uh, uh, increased our success rates. And uh, the duration of surgery has significantly gone down. So intraoperative complications can be formation of cataract, trauma, prolonged surgery can cause uh, uh, disc changes if, the, if we are not taking care of the perfusion and uh, uh, they can be persistent corneal epithelial defects, glaucoma and recurrent bleed. Well, thanks for your kind attention. I think I'll stop here and uh, thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Uh yeah. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Raji, for that uh, talk with all the videos. You are an accomplished surgeon, we all know that, so there is no doubt about that. Uh, would we like to have some uh, basic comments or tips and tricks, um, basically regarding diabetic vitrectomies from our esteemed panel? Just one uh, tip and trick each would uh, go a long way in helping a lot of upcoming surgeons. Dr. Rajiv, please, first. Yeah, so I think uh, rather than tip, I'd first go with what you said, the algorithm approach, what you were thinking, that if a person diabetic comes with a vitreous hemorrhage, majority of time it is proliferative. Dr. Rajiv showed some very nice algorithms. He told that it could be non-diabetic, but the first thing you should think it is proliferative diabetic retinopathy. Good idea to look in the other eye. And if the other eye changes... Usually in 80 to 90% cases, it would be two level difference in two level. Either other eye would be proliferative or more than moderate non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy. That gives you a clue. If it's a fresh hemorrhage, a vitreous hemorrhage, you try to look for whether view is reasonably clear to do your PRP or it is partially clear or it is not at all. If there is no view, you go ahead with the ultrasound B scan. And if there is a traction, you go ahead with immediate surgery. If there is no traction, you can wait. And probably what I do is we watch serially and the moment view becomes clear, you do laser. If not, plan for a surgery within a month. Our threshold, as Dr. Rajiv rightly said, has reduced now. We don't wait for three to six months. But in a month, if you see the heme is clearing, you still wait. Otherwise, you go ahead with the surgery. And if it's a partial view, that becomes sometimes you again look for tractional element. If no tractional element, you can complete PRP, whatever extent, even give an anti vegf If you feel every two, three weeks, he's not coming. If he's coming on a regular follow-up, I tend to follow up every two weeks. If he is clearing, do the laser. Except for a couple of situations like type 1 diabetes, NVI, uh, one-eyed person, bilateral vitreous hemorrhage, you tend to go, go early. You don't wait for a month. These are the cases early vitrectomy as a rule. I think this decision is important when to go. Dr. Parveen, please. Yeah, I think uh, uh, Rajiv has also showed us uh, very good indications and nicely summed up. Only one, I would say, almost like a point of caution. So as he said that our tolerance has become less and we don't wait for too long, but I would, you know, like to really worry about something called the gel vitreous 
when you see that and you don't see too much of PVD, you need to be very careful, especially if not a previously laser dye also. Sometimes inducing PVD and separating this gel vitreous from the retina can become very difficult. So this can be in absence of fibrovascular proliferation, very minimal fibrovascular tissue, but you go in because there is vitreous hemorrhage and you are kind of wanting to clear it. So if it is gel vitreous, complete PVD induction becomes difficult and you end up the surgery with having breaks and vitreous still attached. I think one thing which Dr. Mahesh Shanmugam always says, I would again reiterate that point. If the retina is seen clearly, these are difficult cases. If you don't see the retina, these are much easy cases. Okay. So I think it that ultrasound, if you yeah. document PVD, it will be good. You see the yeah. retina means that area, there is no subhyloid hemorrhage. Okay. So the gel vitreous is stuck to the retina. So beware of that situation. And in those cases, even if the vision is 660 or less, don't go in early. Just a question. Uh, if you are anticipating to do vitreous surgery in a patient with vitreous hemorrhage, would you do a preoperative laser if you're expecting, really expecting, or would you prefer just to manage with anti-VEGF uh, for these patients? So if you're going to do a preoperative laser, then please wait for two weeks at least before you go in. Because otherwise, if you go in and the, your retinal edema is fresh from laser marks and you try to peel off the vitreous from there, you will open up some of the laser marks. And uh, intravitreal anti-VEGF, I usually... If there is a large fibrovascular problem and uh, I have a lot of dissection to do and there is no PVD, flat prolif. And another thing which probably I would also like to have the opinion of the panelists, sometimes you come across a case of combined retinal detachment, CRD, but not all cases of CRD will have complete PVD. There will be some areas where it will be really stuck on and it will really vascular. So in those cases, do you give an intravitreal injection pre-surgery or do you wait? Personally, I give, but I operate a little quickly. I don't wait till three days or five days. I will want to operate quickly. I would want to know if everybody else also does the same thing in combined retinal detachments because retina is very thin here, but the PVD still may not be complete. Yeah, I usually inject. Definitely I inject and I give after three to four days. Anyway, I'm going in. And it's a yes. combined RT. Even if, see, uh, you want to give that time because anti vegf acts by two ways. One is it is reducing vascularity. Second, you also, cause because of its contraction, you get a little plane of surgery becomes better. So I would tend to, I usually give after three to four days only do the surgery. I don't do it early. In CRDs, you would, you know, not, definitely not want to wait for too long because already there is a pull oh. and... But three to four, as routinely we do three to four days, same thing I continue for CRD also. Okay. I yeah. think we're running short of time. Uh, Dr. Ramindi. Yeah, only you... last point. Uh, uh, while we are uh, doing lasers and waiting, please send them to endocrinologist because uh, their sugar control is very important. The moment you plan for surgery, their sugars are 300. So I think systemic management is very important because you will not inject if, even if their sugars are not controlled. So moment you see a diabetic patient and you plan for laser, plan for the systemic control also. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rajiv, for that wonderfully clear talk. The only thing I'm confused is that you're in Goa, but you're dressed for Delhi. Yeah. <laughs> I just came out of the session only. Now okay. uh, I'll send you the photographs okay. after. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So uh, um, uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Mudit, who is... Uh, the head of retinal services at LVP, we have given a, him a topic which is actually a pot puri. That is everything else that is hard to explain. Dr. Mudit will explain it to us. Over to you, Dr. Mudit. Yeah, I hope I'm audible and my screen is visible. Yeah, very much. All Please right, go yeah. ahead. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you, AUS, Dr. Unni and all the organizers for having me here. And so, like Dr. Unni said, I will be speaking about a topic which is hemorrhages in eyes, where we already know what is happening. We already know that these are systemic disorders or patient has got any infectious pathology which is underlying there or an inflammatory pathology. So, what do you do when you encounter a hemorrhage in these eyes? We have already had some great talks on eyes with vitreous hemorrhage in diabetics, post-cataract surgery, post-trauma. But these are cases where in most cases, 
you already know you are dealing with either a underlying systemic disorder or probably a vitreous hemorrhage in these cases can be a clue for us as ophthalmologists to suspect an underlying inflammatory or a systemic disorder. So what do you do when you see such cases? The first or the obvious question that we need to answer whenever we see hemorrhages in these eyes is why did it happen? And the next question is what do we do next and how do we proceed with those? So let me show you a few examples of the different etiologies or different conditions which can lead to vitreous hemorrhages in eyes with an underlying system abnormality. So if you have an underlying systemic problem which may range from vasculitis to a dyscrasia to any of the inflammatory or infective pathologies, why would a vitreous hemorrhage occur in the first place? And the answer is there's a peripheral ischemia which has led to a neovascularization and that can be one of the reasons for you to develop a hemorrhage in such an eye. The second cause would be any coagulation abnormality which has happened over there in such eyes. So let us go through some of these examples. So what's important for us as ophthalmologists is to take a careful history of the patient and a complete systemic evaluation, not just an ophthalmic evaluation. So when I said that there will be a peripheral ischemia, what would be the causes for this ischemia? And that will be a retinal vasculitis. So you see a vasculitis. A vasculitis, usually in most cases, once it starts resolving, leads to peripheral sclerose vessels. And these are the eyes which go on to develop peripheral ischemia, new vascularization. These blood vessels will obviously in future can bleed and lead to a VH. So a very important investigation in such eyes is an FFA. So if you do an FFA or even now a wide field OCT angiography, you will be able to detect areas of peripheral capillary non-perfusion, peripheral ischemia, peripheral new vascularization. And these are eyes which will go on to require a peripheral sector laser photocoagulation. So that is what you do when you detect ischemia in these eyes and a peripheral new vascularization. So this was one more patient. This was a known case of SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus. The right eye had these multiple areas of infarct, some hemorrhages, peripheral sclerosis. versus the left eye had a vitreous hemorrhage and there was no view. We did a B ultrasound B scan and we have already had a talk where we have seen how a B scan can be a very important modality in such cases where you can't visualize what's happening in the retina. But the retina was attached. What we did at this point, this was a patient who was diagnosed as SLE after she came to the retina clinic. So she came with these multiple areas of ischemia, sclerosis vessels, few hemorrhages, peripheral sclerosis vessels. We got her tested for ANA. Turned out to be a case of SLE. We referred her to a rheumatologist, was started on systemic treatment. Two months later, this is how the patient presented to us with the hemorrhage nearly predominantly resolved. We did an FFA later, found peripheral ischemia, did a laser. But most of the initial vitreous hemorrhage that had happened got resolved by itself just after a systemic control. So that shows how important a good systemic control is in these cases. Takayasu arthritis, another case. You see this peripheral extensive neovascularization of the disc. Some peripheral hemorrhages get them investigated. Get the BP checked and it becomes important for us to communicate to our physician to get the blood pressure checked, not just by auscultatory, but by palpatory method also, because you may end up missing those differentials of blood pressure in both the limbs. But get these patients systemically evaluated and they will need treatment. One more cause which can present with a picture like this can be a radiation retinopathy. So I have not got a picture of that over here, but if you see a patient who has got a past history of having taken radiation for any head and neck malignancy or a neck cancer, and they came to you with an image of or a picture of peripheral ischemia or vitreous hemorrhage, suspect radiation retinopathy again in these cases. Another cause when you see multiple peripheral areas of neovascularization, heart exudates, would be IRVAN, idiopathic retinal vasculitis, aneurysm and neuroretinitis. These are eyes which will need not only peripheral laser, but also aggressive systemic immunosuppression and steroid treatment. So you need to treat these eyes and you need to treat the underlying disease. So vitreous hemorrhages in a lot of these cases can be a clue to an underlying disease. It becomes important for us as ophthalmologists to pick these up and start a concurrent treatment, not just for the hemorrhage, but also for the underlying pathology that is leading to the hemorrhage in the first place. So this patient actually underwent a PRP and subsequently also underwent a VR surgery, a vitrectomy in both eyes. And this is how the patient's final picture was at six months of follow-up after immunosuppression. Another cause, when you see this extensive peripheral vasculitis, 
and you can see this peripheral is of hemorrhage again this is a picture which can happen in eyes with sle it can happen in leukemias it can be idiopathic sometimes it can also happen in a cmv retinitis so when you see such a picture again be prepared to identify what is happening underneath not just get flummox by the hemorrhages whether they are retinal or in the vitreous Acute retinal necrosis, though, presents usually with a significant vitritis, but because of the fact that it causes such a significant peripheral arthritis and occlusive vasculitis, can also occasionally present to us with a vitreous hemorrhage. And therefore, it becomes important for us to look at what's happening to the blood vessels in these eyes. It's not just the vitritis, but also the vitreous hemorrhage that can occur in these eyes. So if you see extensive peripheral occlusive vasculitis, like what you're seeing in this case, suspect and treat the underlying ARN also. So moving on to how do you approach these eyes with vasculitis? First of all, there are some very common clues which can help us in actually identifying the etiology. If you see subvascular pigmented patches, think of TB, unifocal retinitis, sometimes with no hemorrhages, but sometimes rarely peripheral signs of ischemia, but a unifocal retinitis, toxoplasma, retinitis with hemorrhages, viral retinitis usually. Non-infectious disease also can sometimes lead to peripheral occlusion and subsequently a vitreous hemorrhage. Now understand that the hemorrhage over here is a sequelae to the vasculitis that has occurred, but we need to take care of the underlying inflammation also. So if you see a patient who had a history of a mobile hypopion, absence of fibrin, that characteristic fun pattern sort of an appearance, then understand that the underlying was secondary to this. And therefore, if you see a patient with a history of abscess ulcers, genital ulcers, bechets, if there are past history of synechia, diffuse KPs, history of an elevated IOP earlier, sarcoidosis. So these are the causes of an underlying vasculitis, which we need to treat along with taking care of the hemorrhage. So usual investigations, I'll not dwell into them, but we need to investigate them for the underlying causes. Also, one more important pathology which we need to keep in mind is when you see these white centered hemorrhages occasionally. And that is a pointer to the fact that you are dealing with a blood dyscrasia. So white centered hemorrhages or what we call the rot spots rule out a blood dyscrasia. So when we investigate these patients, what are the things that we need to do? We have already done an ultrasound B scan in case we are not able to visualize things. If you are able to visualize, we need to find out why the hemorrhage occurred in the first place. And therefore a complete blood count Sugar levels, obviously, because you do need to rule out underlying diabetes. Liver function test and renal function test, because these patients will need long-term immunosuppression. Therefore, you need to take care of the liver and renal parameters. And a very important investigation, something which is very easy to get done, not at all costly, but sometimes is ignored, is to get a peripheral blood smear done in all of these cases. Because a lot of times the hemorrhage may actually be secondary to an underlying coagulation abnormality that can happen in cases of these dyscrasias. Other investigations obviously will be to rule out the underlying retinitis or the infective pathology that has happened in the first place. So we have treatment uh, in terms of vasculitis, I'll come to that, but you need to also take care of the underlying pathology. If it is a TB vasculitis, you treat in lines of how you will treat a case of tuberculosis or sarcoidosis, ARN or retinitis will need treatment in the time or on the same lines as how you treat a viral retinitis. For predominantly arterial involvement, like what you will happen to see in cases of SLE, it becomes important for us to talk to a rheumatologist and get their treatment initiated. Hydroxychloroquine and immunosuppression will need to be constituted for these patients. When you see signs of ischemia, obviously for us to take care of the hemorrhage, we need to do a laser photocoagulation. Apart from that, some of these patients will need a vitrectomy when the vitreous hemorrhage is significant enough to not allow visualization or in case of non-resolution of vitreous hemorrhage or if there is a peripheral traction, then obviously we'll treat in lines of how you would anyways treat a vitreous hemorrhage. So this was the patient of Irwan which did end up needing a vitrectomy and this is how the patient resolved subsequently. So let me just show you one last case to illustrate how vitreous hemorrhages can in eyes with a systemic abnormality sometimes confound us. This was a patient who came to us with a retinitis lesion with few small hemorrhages at the edge of the lesion in the right eye. The left eye had a total obscured view because of both a mixture of vitreous as well as a vitreous hemorrhage. We got the patient investigated systemically. This patient turned out to be a case of a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And therefore what we did was we took a biopsy from the left eye 
the cytology came out to be negative, but the biopsy came out to be positive for HSV1 and CMV DNA. The PCR was negative for toxoplasma and was also the cytology was not positive for any lymphoma cells. So this patient was treated with intravitreal well gain intravitreal gain cyclovir because the patient was not tolerant to well gain cyclovir, developed a myelosuppression. So the patient with intravitreal cyclovir for the right eye. The left eye we did not do much because it was no PL to begin with, but subsequently the vision improved to 2025 in the right eye, which was maintained till the last follow-up. So, in a nutshell, vitreous hemorrhages in eyes with an underlying systemic abnormality need a slightly different approach as compared to what you will otherwise do. The hemorrhage obviously will be treated the same way as what we would have done. Otherwise, you will take care of the hemorrhage by doing a laser if there is ischemia or a vitrectomy. But apart from taking care of just the hemorrhage, you also need to keep in mind few facts. You need to control the inflammation. You need to ensure that there is a systemic stabilization you need to check for the coagulation profile and then the usual treatments for the hemorrhage as such. Thank you so much. I'll stop sharing my slides. Uh, thank yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mudit. That was, uh, I mean, uh, it reaffirms my faith that you were the best person for that talk. But uh, on a more uh, generalized note for everybody, when uh, Dr. Shobit has told us all about the importance of the other eye, evaluating the other eye before even the uh, webinar started, I would like to ask you, what are the clues that could lead on to your basic uh, algorithm of differentiating infectious infiltrative hematological causes uh, when, uh, you, uh, when a patient presents with just a vitreous hemorrhage first? Yeah, so if you look at the other eye or even if you can see through the vitreous hemorrhage, if it's too dense a vitreous hemorrhage and it's non-dissolving, then obviously a lot of these cases, we would approach it the same way. You probably will go ahead and decide to do a vitrectomy for an eye which is having a non-dissolving vitreous hemorrhage. But the other eye can offer substantial clues in terms of the fact that you may have clinical picture which is not masked by the hemorrhage. So white-centered hemorrhages like I had shown will be a clue to an underlying blood dyscrasia. Similarly, if you see signs of vasculitis in the other eye, that will help us in recognizing the fact that this is not because of any diabetes or any vascular occlusion, but because of an underlying vasculitis. If you see a retinitis, the general dictum is that all retinitis are infective unless proven otherwise. But in most cases, most causes of a hemorrhage post a retinitis are usually ARN, which can probably lead to that significant peripheral occlusion. But otherwise, usually retinitis do not that commonly lead to a vitreous hemorrhage as compared to a Bechet's, which is a non-infectious cause of a retinitis. But the main underlying pathology is just the peripheral occlusion that has occurred. So you need to look at both the IC, what are the systemic parameters in these cases. Lot of times you may already know what is an underlying etiology. You may already know that you are dealing with a case of an SLE or any connective tissue disorder. And therefore, it becomes important to take care of the systemic parameters and the systemic condition also. Thank you, Dr. Mehdi. Do we have any uh, points yeah. and comments, please, Dr. Mehdi? Yeah. Honey, I, I would like to have uh, a great talk, Mudit. The few, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a uh, few cases, I remember in, in an eye in where one eye has a retinitis pigmentosa like picture and other eye has vitreous hemorrhage. You know, you should know that uh, the uh, there is a, something called quotes like response in retinitis pigmentosa. So even RP patients have a vitreous hemorrhage. And same with the uh, the juvenile X link, uh, uh, the XLRS children, they have they can present with the vitreous hemorrhage in one eye. You know the other eye, if you see the fovea, and you will be able to pick up the XLRS in these patients. And then there is an entity called the nowadays VPT, the vitreous proliferative tumors, which are particularly seen in the uveitic eyes. And uh, uh, if you have a vitreous hemorrhage and you do an ultrasound, you will see a mass-like lesion there in the down there somewhere. So uh, you should remember that VPTs can present and they can be the cause of the vitreous hemorrhage in these eyes. Yeah, this is what I I, I can I would like to add. Oh, that's a great point. that's a great point regarding the VPTs. What we previously used to think of microvascular anomalies in the periphery now uh, categorized as VPTs in uh, proliferative uh, infectious inflammatory disease. I mean, I think uh, Dr. Um, uh, Rupa can uh, we can go to the next talk because uh, Dr. Rupa can introduce us because we're running slightly short of time. Uh, uh, we are running short of time, but again, uh, thank you, thank you, Unni. This is this is we are we are dealing with the whole spectrum. 
So what happens when, when you have a vitreous hemorrhage with a background of uh, known macular degeneration, especially age-related age macular degeneration. And for that, Dr. Shubhendu Bodal will talk on that. He's a senior vitreous surgeon at Disha Eye Hospital, Kolkata, and uh, surgeon par excellence and an excellent human being. Dr. Shubhendu, please. Thank you, Dr. Rupak. Am I audible? Hello? Am I yeah. audible? Uh, yes, you are. Please continue. Oh, okay. Yes, yes. So, uh, my topic is vitreous hemorrhage in a patient with, uh, with known AMD. Sorry for joining late in your discussions. Like today, I had some other uh, commitments. So, coming to our topic, it is exudative AMD. The vision loss develops due to the presence of choroidal neovascularization, which can lead to uh, uh, retinal pigment, epithelial detachment, hard exudate formation, macular edema, subretinal or submacular hemorrhage, retinal detachment, breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage, or subretinal fibrosis or scar formation. So, uh, our topic is breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage in patients with uh, AMD. That it is not a, at all a common complication of exudative AMD. Actually, the reported prevalence is uh, two to seven percent. Whereas in PCB, it is actually more common because the incidence of subretinal hemorrhage is quite uh, more uh, more more co common than the uh, post AMD cases, as well as the incidence of breakthrough hemorrhage is also very common. Like four to it ranges is four. 0.5 to 19.9%. So what is the mechanism of breakthrough hemorrhage in patients with AMD or PCB? Actually, blood enters into the vitreous cavity through the microscopic leakage from the retina within the ILM and uh, from the uh, through a small break in the ILM. And appearance of the blood in the vitreous cavity usually occurs within three weeks after the episode of subretinal hemorrhage. So breakthrough hemorrhage is also due to either exudative AMD or PCB can lead to further uh, loss of vision. So spontaneous absorption may occur, which is a very rare event, but most of the patients uh, of non-clearing vitreous hemorrhage needs partial vitrectomy. So uh, I, 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 am, I, I want to highlight what's one uh, interesting fact that if the patient is uh, having the submacular hemorrhage post AMD and the patient is receiving intervital antiphagic injection, so what are the risk factors for breakthrough hemorrhage in this patient? It is if the patient is taking anticoagulant medication or if the, uh, if the size of the submacular hemorrhage is very uh, large, diameter in size and if it is a PCB subtype, the chance of breakthrough hemorrhage is very high. So what is the same kind of situation, whereas if you're treating the patient with intervitreal RTPA and gas injections and the chance, the risk factors of, for development of breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage, the, the, the number one smoking status, number two area area ratio of the submacular hemorrhage to the optic disc is two disc diameter three disc diameter four disc diameter that means the total size of the submacular hemorrhage as well as the height of the submacular hemorrhage so the treatment options hardly uh, hardly there are like any role of any anti vgf in treatment as well as the rtp injections so anti vgf it is not only controversial having controversial but also it is actually increase the workload, cost, and as well as the complications. And the intervitreal RTPA has, has a very doubtful role, whether it is at all effective uh, to clear up the uh, breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage or not, it is uh, it is not known. No study highlighted the fact. So vitrectomy is the only option, whether you can do it early vitrectomy or late vitrectomy. Early vitrectomy means less than three months, and late vitrectomy means more than three months. So early vitrectomy is always beneficial than late vitrectomy for the breakthrough vitreous hemorrhage as late vitreous, uh, vitrectomy can delay the absorption of the submacular hemorrhage and delay in further anti of treatment or uh, ultimately forming the disc uh, scar formation. Whereas early vitrectomy is treating the, the clearing the vitreous hemorrhage and you're seeing the submacular hemorrhage, you can inject subretinal TPA or intervitreal TPA or add anti of injection at the end of your surgery that can cause early uh, resolution of the submacular hemorrhage or you can decrease the CNBM, it can prevent further scar formation, further damage to the uh, macula. So, big to vitreous hemorrhage, it is the prognosis actually depends on the associated retinal pathology, that's particularly the macular pathology, whether there is submacular scar, submacular mild hemorrhage or subretinal hemorrhage that sparing the macula, that is having the maximum good prognosis uh, cases. But in, if the patient is having significant submacular hemorrhage or total hemorrhage retinal detachment, you have to do some kind of active treatment, otherwise a patient won't gain anything uh, 
uh, that there is a pre-operatively patient will be PLPR and post-operatively will be a patient with also hand movement or marginal improvement will be there. But if, so pre-operative uh, counseling is very much important in this type of cases. So when to suspect the underlying EMV pathology in a patient with vitreous hemorrhage? Right? Well, like, uh, all? Yeah, all like clinically, the uh, the color of the vitreous hemorrhage is typically brownish in uh, color, like, like a show, uh, showing you. And I'm just removing the uh, retrolental uh, old blood, and you can see the, the color of the blood is not that white, and it is quite old, but still you can see the brownish color of the uh, blood because it is the denatured hemoglobin, long-standing vitreous hemorrhage. You can see the brownish color of the blood. It's a typical... Uh, post AMD vitreous hemorrhage. This is the color, uh, denatured hemoglobin, and uh, the, the blood is very much sticky. Sometimes the cutter can be stuck in within the cannula because of the sticky uh, nature of the vitreous. So, sub um, ultrasonography is the second uh, choice because in these type of cases, the ultrasonography is sometimes very complex. Like you are hardly seeing the uh, the retina, and you can you have to anticipate there is shallow retinal detachment, and you have to increase the gain settings also to detect the mildest form of the subretinal hemorrhage. Otherwise, it won't get it. So you have to detect whether you have to plan it accordingly, whether you have to, uh, and, uh, after cleaning the vitreous hemorrhage, what to do next, like uh, should, you, should you go for the intravitreal or subretinal RTPA or anti of injection. So further management is also necessary because these are not clear cut cases. And other eye situation is also very important, presence of uh, drusens uh, is present or not. Like in this case, type of cases where you can see, see you can uh, the, some, sometimes the uh, junior descendant can be like, uh, can take up this case as a like sub highlight hemorrhage. But it is, sub, you have to identify the groove between the like, it is sub retinal hemorrhage and the retina is inserting into the up to the opt optic disc. So you have to identify the yellow colored, you can highlight, I am highlighting it, yellow colored, this retina and the red colored groove that groove it should be is very important whether it is sub retinal or sub hyaluronic hemorrhage so this is another uh, this is a case where you can see the old uh, vitreous hemorrhage and after clearing the vitreous hemorrhage it was the blood was not that brownish in color but it is quite white in color just like other cases of old vitreous hemorrhage but you can see there is a lot of sub retinal hemorrhage but macula is not that much involved so i had the uh, interoperatively i had that uh, um, RTP options, so I have given the intermediate uh, subretinal RTP followed by and I had the anti vegf option also. I have given the anti vegf as well as the uh, sub uh, filtered air as a cocktail injection. So, so in this case, case I have treated it uh, like as a routine case of subretinal hemorrhage. But yeah, but you, sometimes you have to be very ready. Uh, like uh, you have to uh, keep your all the options open what to do next uh, after clearing the vitreous hemorrhage. Not only the clearing the vitreous hemorrhage will be beneficial for the patient. This is another case where, where sorry. This is another case where uh, after clearing the vitreous hemorrhage, you can see the, uh, the hemorrhagic retinal detachment is uh, visible. And it, it is not that much very dense. So I have given a, a subretinal RTPA with the help of metallic subretinal TP cannula and waited for some time and then uh, then uh, the retinotomy to clear up the uh, clear up the, all the subretinal blood from infra uh, infranasal quadrant, and after clearing the blood significantly, there was a lot of blood was there in the macular area. So I planned for a uh, like second retinotomy in the diagonally opposite side and try to clear up the temporal uh, from the temporal side the, all the subretinal blood and checked it and did uh, as uh, the period exchange followed by laser as well as i'm um, injecting uh, silicon at the end of surgery and this is another case where uh, you, you have to be very careful because preoperatively ultrasonography was showing hugely elevated hemorrhagic retinal detachment so after clearing all the blood, uh, I have injected subretinal uh, uh, TPA and then uh, did temporal retinectomy uh, to uh, the, the, remove the lysed blood and uh, clear up all the subretinal blood clearly. And uh, this kind of very tedious kind of surgery. And uh, then yeah, you have to reappose the retina. Now the retina is nicely attached. You can see and do the laser all around as well as just treat the case like a GRT case. So subretinal TPA followed by 
Dinage of temporal via through the temporal volatility retinectomy and uh, injecting silicon at the end of the surgery. So this is another case where the subretinal hemorrhage removal was uh, done and the old subretinal hemorrhage, sub RP hemorrhage also visible. So I planned for the RP core at patch graft transplantation and uh, did temporal retinectomy and removed all the uh, subretinal blood and it was totally clotted blood. So vitreous hemorrhage post MD or post PCB, there's a not at all a Uh, so you are not audible. We cannot hear you, Doctor Bodal. No, I think uh, there is some problem. But nine o'clock uh, has it been over? The live. Uh, Doctor uh, Doctor Shabadi, you are not audible. Is that the worst? Yeah, yeah, bad. Okay. Sorry, I'm directly coming to the my slide. So, what are the intraoperative challenges of uh, this kind of situation in post AMD uh, vitreous hemorrhage? Vitreous hemorrhage. Cutter may stuck inside the cannula by the sticky blood. So, uh, that that point I already highlighted. And the dilemma in uh, dilemma in further managing the management of the after removing the vitreous hemorrhage. What to do next? Like, should we go for the like, if there is submetal scan, nothing can be done. So, if there is subretinal hemorrhage is there, then you can treat the patient uh, with uh, intravitreal RTPA or subretinal RTPA as well as anti VEGF injection. So, all these are the uh, options are there. Yeah, Dr. Baral. Uh, yes. Uh, no, no. Not Not audible. Am I audible? Yeah, you're audible. Can you, uh, yeah, try to go to the next slide after that? Basically, I'm just finishing. It was my last slide. And yes, yes, please go ahead. So, so we have we have already overshooted nine o'clock. So yes. We just yes. need to close up as early as possible. Yes, it is already. I have done it. Yeah, please. You can so these are the all complex cases and worst prognosis cases. So it should be very be ready with all your treatment modalities for the from the for the like mildest to most radical scenario. Thank you. Yes, okay. that is an excellent excellent talk and with great uh, surgical uh, show with all different difficult cases of uh, you know vitreous hemorrhage with AMD. Uh, would like to have a few comments from uh, our panelists. Kim, sir. Uh, Thank you. Dr. Can you stop the sharing, please? Yeah, only uh, one comment. Uh, very good surgeries, but yeah. then things to remember is that sometimes intravitreal TPA can also work very well. And yeah, some yes, ma'am. Yeah, and um, uh, sometimes these patients are in the extreme of age group. Most of the time, the AMD patients 80, 80 plus, and sometimes it's difficult to take them to the surgical theater also. So, in those kind of situations, that TPA with the gas pneumatic displacement can also work well with large submacular hemorrhages, but then risk of breakthrough hemorrhage, vitreous hemorrhage is very high in these cases. That I Yes, um, thank you. Yes. Remember, but these are all very challenging cases, of course. Challenging. Diabetic and MD cases are always worst prognosis and very challenging. These two, sir. No, one thing I I found very that true. Uh, we have a yeah only uh, last I I think one thing uh, the twenty m hertz probe of ultrasound we should uh, we should use to find out the uh, you know uh, bleed submacular bleed. You know, if we, in case of a vitreous hemorrhage with a submacular bleed, I think uh, uh, we should go early in these cases. Yes. 
otherwise otherwise the prognosis will be very bad like and you have to explain the patient preoperatively that you may not gain the full vision just like in other situations absolutely yeah so yeah do we have any other yeah. comments we have a yeah we have a question from the audience that how uh, fluid air exchange is the opd uh, fluid air fluid gas exchange is done so i think the dr dhanas has answered it here so in uh, for the audience of should we this is the opd fluid gas exchange is done under topical or local anesthesia and you can take air or gas filled syringe with 26 gauge needle you can go through the limbus in case of aphekia or through the parsplana in case of phakic or pseudophakic eyes and inject some amount of the air and withdraw some amount of the fluid these actions are repeated till the most of the intervitreal fluid is removed yeah that uh, you know most of the time you can do by two syringe in one syringe you can just inject the air or gas the other other way you can take it out but the most easy way, way what you can do is off you can just have a you know a, a two ml syringe where filled with gas or air and you can turn the eye or uh, towards uh, the dependent part and through the dependent part you can you know go into the vitreous cavity and inject some amount of the air and then uh, take out some amount of the fluid so by that the fluid comes down into the syringe and the air remains up so again push some amount of the air and then take out and by that uh, you can titrate the uh, iop as well so that you should not cause much hypotony or much high iop during this process i hope uh, we could explain you in short uh any any uh, closing comments for uh, from our panelist i think very well covered all the points and all the aspects i think dr kim sir was uh, was about to oh yeah dr kim yes ma'am you know, i was just going to say the same thing what parveen was saying that i think there was a we had a wonderful compilation of all the talks uh, you know covering all the reasons why how do you manage when a patient presents with vitreous hemorrhage i think all the speakers spoke so beautifully about the causes of how it happens and how do you manage it it's a wonderful session i think very important session i feel uh, because this is one topic that uh, we don't spend too much time on just on vitreous hemorrhage i think it's a good one and uh, every speaker made a a uh, very elaborate presentation on each of this so thank you unni and uh, rupak thank you sir thank you and uh, uh, from my side i'd like to thank all the uh, speakers and panelists and our eminent chairman of persons for guiding us through the uh, the uh, this session dr rupak your uh, concluding remarks please uh yeah yeah only i think i think this is this is a, a tremendous job uh, excellent presentations to all our uh, presenters and uh, putting their powers by our panelists and you know uh, the the the, the witty answers by our chair persons so that makes a whole whole 360 degree about which is and i would like to thank avs for uh, you know putting this kind of uh, good a uh, topic which is very very uh, important for our day to day practice for the child practice and for especially for the budding surgeons i hope that uh, we will have like this kind of webinars in future as well and i would like to thank our my co uh, moderator dr unni also who has taken all the you know effort to make it a grand success thanks to all of us and let's have a dinner as well yeah thank you to uh, mr sunil of zadi thank you for coming in and making things very smooth for the uh, all of us thank you mr sunil thank you yes